April 29, 1996 Observer Newsletter, Brian Pillman Humvee Accident Aftermath, Giant Wins the WCW Title, UFC vs. Federal Court, Tons More. By Observer Staff. Wrestling Observer Newsletter. P.O. Box 1228, Campbell, California 95009128. April 29, 1996. Brian Pillman was released from University Hospital in Cincinnati on April 19 after rolling his Humvee, open-air military vehicle, four nights earlier and suffering numerous injuries, the most serious of which was a crushed ankle. When the police and medics found Pillman Monday night moments after taking a 40-foot fall from being ejected as the vehicle rolled, he had lost so much blood that those who found him believed he wasn't going to make it. His face was so swollen early in the week that even his own sister couldn't have identified him and there was initial fear the fall could have done damage to the spinal cord which could have been a crippling injury. He was in the burns unit at the hospital early in the week and originally in intensive care, although his condition was quickly upgraded. By the end of the week, after surgery which included taking bone from his hip to reconstruct his ankle, he was told that the long-term prognosis was good and that the injuries shouldn't be serious enough to threaten his wrestling career. He was allowed to go home from the hospital for the weekend. Pillman, who had undergone his 34th throat operation just a few weeks earlier related to a throat condition he had as a young child which is why his voice is so raspy, underwent facial plastic surgery to repair some bone fractures in his face which included a broken nose, a fractured cheekbone and dislocated jaw on April 22. The surgery included having his jaw wired shut for approximately one week. Pillman, who was wearing a heavy Harley biker jacket when injected, believed the thickness of the jacket saved him from more serious injuries as the jacket itself was torn to shreds. It also felt fortunate the injuries weren't worse and that for whatever reason, he wasn't wearing his seat belt at the time he rolled the Humvee after striking a tree stump in a field on the side of Kentucky Route 338 near his home. The vehicle was destroyed and he was told by police that had he been wearing his seat belt and not been thrown that he would have been crushed inside the vehicle. Doctors told Pillman that it will be eight weeks before he can start rehabilitating the ankle and perhaps another month after that before he can go back to the ring. Pillman, who is a small bone person, has had problems with the ankle stemming back from a previous ankle injury that ended his pro football career when he was playing with the Calgary Stampeders in the Canadian Football League. As luck would have it, that ankle injury turned into the best career break of his life because it led him to Bruce Hart and Stampede Wrestling where he started his career in 1987. Pillman became a far bigger star and earned more money in pro wrestling than he ever could have hoped being a lineman at his size in pro football. It is actually believed with the ankle reconstruction that his ankle will be stronger than it had been previously because it had never been 100% since the football injury. The accident occurred two days before Pillman's contract with WCW, believed to be at around $225,000 per year, was to expire. Pillman has had informal talks since the accident both with WWF and WCW and the injury doesn't appear to be nearly the hindrance in getting a new deal as first thought since it appears both groups believe Pillman's strength in wrestling right now is his persona. We don't have much in the way of details, but the giant, Paul White, captured the WCW title from Ric Flair in the second hour of the taping of WCW Nitro on April 22 in Albany, Georgia. The match will air as the main event of the April 29th Nitro show which isn't being done live because Eric Bischoff and several of WCW's other top wrestlers will be in Japan for the New Japan Tokyo Dome show that same night. The decision to go with the Giant as champion was made at least several weeks back, as apparently the Giant vs. Sting main event match for the Slamboree pay-per-view was always going to be a world title match. No doubt the decision to have it happen when it did stems from the idea that the word would get out since it was taped, and it would lead to a ratings boost on April 29th when WCW has to move Nitro for four weeks to a 7 p.m. start time because of TNT's commitments to the NBA playoffs and immediately establish the time slot to wrestling fans. The only details we've heard about the match is that it went about nine minutes. As with most decisions of the type this one will be controversial. Even though Flair is 47 and the natural criticism is that he's too old to be put in the top position and his match quality isn't what it was in his prime, the fact is it's the Flair-Randy Savage feud on top which has led to the revitalization of house show business and based on this past weekend, that feud shows no signs at all of being on its downward slide. From a personality standpoint and an ability to get over a hot angle, there is still nobody close in WCW. The Giant 24 is the type of wrestler who doesn't need the belt to be a focal point, and may be exposed for his limitations when the belt is put on him. Basically all the reasons nobody ever put a world title on Andre the Giant during his prime even though he was the biggest drawing card in wrestling at the time. In this day and age, 
the WCW title is always going to change hands frequently anyway and the effect of who holds the belt when it comes to things like drawing power and television ratings is minimal in comparison with the WWF title, which has been booked in a manner giving it more emphasis and meaning. For those interested in such things and considering the WCW as the descendant of the most widely recognized pro wrestling world heavyweight title, Giant wouldn't be the youngest wrestler ever to hold the title, that is believed to have been Luthez, who won it for the first time in 1937, when he was 21 years old. But he is the first rookie ever to hold the title and one of the youngest wrestlers ever. Both Tommy Rich, who held the title for a few days in 1980, and Kerry Von Erich, who held it for a few weeks in 1984, were 24. Giant had one pro match on a Larry Sharp Indy a few years back, but for all real purposes, his pro debut was on October 29, 1995 in the match against Hulk Hogan at Halloween Havoc in Detroit, so he would have captured the title in his sixth month in the ring. Perhaps the most important match in the two-plus year history of the Ultimate Fighting Championships takes place on April 25 not in an octagon but in federal court in Detroit. The court case is largely an attempt by local politicians to have the May 17th UFC pay-per-view event blocked from Detroit's Cobo Arena, where more than 7,200 tickets had been sold as of last week. But the ramifications, in either victory or defeat, for Semaphore Entertainment Group, the UFC's parent company, are a lot larger. Michigan Attorney General Frank Kelly and Wayne County, where Detroit is located District Attorney John O'Hare are attempting to get the show stopped citing state assault laws and an 1896 statute involving laws against prize fighting, which in those days meant boxing, without gloves. The first law was the same argument that largely forced the first extreme fighting championship pay-per-view event out of New York City last November. Assault laws in most states, including Michigan are either never applied, or legally prohibited from being applied, in regard to contact sports. The 1896 statute, in theory, could also be applied to such events as judo tournaments, pro wrestling or even mud wrestling in bars. Kelly and O'Hare will attempt to argue that UFC is not a sport and therefore the laws apply and the event can be banned. Kelly and O'Hare brought the lawsuit before a Wayne County Circuit judge, however Semaphore Entertainment Group then got the case moved to federal district court so the result of the ruling would set a precedent, win or lose, to either allow or basically stop future events of this type from being threatened by attempting to use assault laws throughout the United States. O'Hare called the UFC an insult to Detroiters who are trying to stop the violence and make it a good, healthy environment to raise children. UFC promoter Bob Marowitz called his event a sportsmanlike event featuring extraordinary athletes. Olympia Arenas Incorporated, who runs Kobo, appears to have publicly taken less of a supportive posture in regard to the event. Mark Corey, vice president of Olympia, said in an article in the Detroit Free Press that his company was in no way involved with the content, production or promotion of the event. Al Russo, the vice mayor of Charlotte, North Carolina, which housed two previous UFC shows and whose city council voted to ban future events after the second one, called the show a human cockfight and said, it was quite brutal, barbaric. You fight until one man is out, and there are no rules. I just don't think that's human. The Detroit article was full of the typical fiction such as the claim that the promoters are advertising the Detroit show as the bloodiest and most barbaric show in history. In fact there has been no advertising coming anywhere close to saying that on cable, Semaphore Entertainment Group has toned down all ads, and while EFC has pushed the envelope more, even they have never come close to a statement like that. At press time there had been no advertising whatsoever for the live event in the Detroit market. The fact Semaphore Entertainment Group has such a huge advance before it had spent a penny on advertising in the market makes the advance sales that much more impressive. A victory in court by Semaphore would set a precedent that wouldn't allow communities to claim the event wasn't sport and therefore threatening to shut it down using assault laws couldn't be applied. It would come off a victory in U.S. federal court in Puerto Rico which basically established that they could legally hold the event anywhere that it isn't specifically banned. Even if UFC wouldn't be classified as sport using the letter of the law, the specific assault statute Kelly was trying to use to stop the event still shouldn't apply because the Michigan law Kelly was attempting to use to get the event stopped was one which allows the state to stop assault with intent to do great bodily harm. And in UFC, there is no intent to do bodily harm as the specific goals the top stars are training for is attempting to win the match, either via submission, decision or knockout, without seriously injuring the opponent. Even with a court ruling in its favor, UFC would hardly be out of the water because of the growing tide in numerous communities to enact new legislation specifically banning the event. Seven states have enacted some sort of legislation in regard to banning the event. One Oklahoma allowed a more dangerous version of the event to go on as long as the participants wore boxing gloves, which inherently made the event more dangerous, the most recent being Hawaii. 
Hawaii had its own local UFC-type promotion called Pancradion, which used chemo as its top draw, that ran several successful events at the Blaisdell Arena in Honolulu in 1995. However the only states in which UFC believes it is banned from are North Carolina and Oklahoma, and the Oklahoma law is being challenged. The Hawaii law would make promoting a show of the type of misdemeanor punishable by a $1,000 fine, which some would simply consider part of the local tax in staging such an event. The state Senate in Illinois this past week voted 97-3 to to ban UFC after it had already been banned in the city of Chicago, with the bill being sent to the state house. Missouri is also talking about introducing legislation to ban the event. The city of Chicago is also attempting to get cable companies within the city to not air future events. Just about every upcoming pay-per-view show as some changes and updates take place over the past week. The April 28th WWF In Your House show from Omaha, Nebraska will end up being a five-match pay-per-view card, all of which have already been announced Shawn Michaels vs. Diesel for the WWF title, Goldust vs. Ultimate Warrior for the IC, Body Donna's vs. Godwins for the WWF tag titles, Vader vs. Razor Ramon and Jake Roberts vs. Davey Boy Smith. The match, which had been talked about, between Mark Merrow and Hunter Hearst Helmsley has been put off, and instead Merrow will appear in the free-for-all match against 1-2-3 Kid, which could be one of the best matches of the entire show. Goldust, despite reports to the contrary, at press time was expected to work the show. Dustin Runnels suffered a torn medial collateral ligament in his knee on April 13 in Dusseldorf, Germany in a match against Ramon and was rushed to Birmingham, Alabama to be examined by world-renowned orthopedist Dr. James Andrews. Andrews said the injury couldn't be fixed through arthroscopic surgery, but was such that Runnels could rehabilitate without undergoing major surgery that would keep him out of action for several months. Goldust is expected to work the pay-per-view match, although he won't be at 100% and will have to baby the knee. He's expected to take some time off, how much isn't exactly clear, after the pay-per-view match so that while he may do angles at the TV tapings, he isn't expected to wrestle on those shows. Davy Boy Smith will also be working the show on a bad knee, having been injured in a match with Bret Hart on the same show as Goldust. Smith, whose injury wasn't nearly as serious as Goldust's, remained on the tour however his scheduled wrestling matches against Ahmed Johnson were turned into arm wrestling matches and he also isn't expected to be 100% for the match with Roberts. We've got the remainder of the WCW Slambury show on May 19th in Baton Rouge. The three matches scheduled that weren't listed in last week's Observer are Ric Flair and Randy Savage vs. Arnold Anderson and Eddie Guerrero, which on paper looks to be the best of all the so-called blind draw matches, Hugh Morris and Meng vs. Diamond Dallas Page, it was announced on television it'll be Bobby Walker but it'll be changed when they do the angle to bring Page back from retirement, and Barbarian, and the Cruiserweight title match is scheduled as Brad Armstrong vs. Dean Malenko. I'm not sure how this will happen, as they'll either announce that Shinjiro Otani, who actually won the title before WCW even started its bogus tournament, won the tournament or more likely that Otani made the finals and will lose the title, in Japan history, or the final match to Armstrong. It can't be Malenko because he's already been eliminated from the tournament twice, although the dreaded double elimination stipulation from the tournament has already been forgotten, possibly in Japan. Either way, it kills the title right off the bat, since even though nearly every wrestler in WCW will tell you that Armstrong is one of the best workers in the company, in fans' eyes he's nothing but a long-time jobber and giving him the title will make this in the fans' eyes, like every lighter weight title in the US probably since the days of Danny Hodge, or at least Tiger Mask, as a jobber's championship of no value. And once Armstrong loses, back to Jobberville shall he go. The general plan for right now is that the hook for the June 16th Great American Bash pay-per-view from Baltimore will be the wrestling debut of Steve McMichael, in either a singles match against Ric Flair, or a tag team match with Kevin Green against Flair and someone, and that the July 7th Bash at the Beach pay-per-view from Daytona Beach would feature Kevin Nash and Scott Hall. Reports are that the Pancras pay-per-view did approximately in 0.25 buy rate, about 60,000 buys and a $269,000 company gross because of the $9.95 price tag. Semaphore Entertainment Group is thrilled with that figure expecting 50,000 buys max and thinking the figure could have been as low as 25,000. The first buy rate was surprisingly high as even Semaphore Entertainment Group officials admit they went into the first show with zero publicity and didn't do any cross-promotion with UFC. It was better than shows like the World Combat Championship, which had far more publicity, and pro wrestling PPVs which had more of base audience already in the US such as WCW's Collision in Korea and its AAA when Worlds Collide shows, and basically the same as the first Extreme Fighting pay-per-view.
which had tremendous media publicity in the Northeast because of the last week's successful attempt to have the event booted out of New York, making it something of a forbidden fruit. It wasn't even all that much lower as far as number of buys than some of the major group pay-per-view events had fallen to by December of 1995 before the recent resurgence as they had dropped to the 80,000 buy level. The buys themselves are not an example of a growing popularity or acceptance of the Pancrase style as compared with the aforementioned other groups, since virtually all those buying did so out of curiosity and had no knowledge of exactly what Pancrase was, and the cheaper price tag probably made a difference there. No doubt the bulk of the buys came from the core UFC audience, which at least appears to be interested in more product. The buy rate of the second pay-per-view will be more representative of how well the style got over and how much long-term interest there will be in the product. The buy rate was more than successful enough for Semaphore Entertainment Group to continue with its plans and the second Pancrase pay-per-view event, entitled The Brawl in Budokan, will air on June 14th, taped on May 16th at Tokyo Budokan Hall. Four matches have already been announced for the show, headlined by Frank Shamrock vs. Boss Rutan for the King of Pancrase Championship. The other three announced matches are Minoru Suzuki vs. Guy Mesger, Masuhatsu Funaki vs. August Smile 6-3, 300-pound pro wrestler for Otto Juan CWA in Austria who currently holds the group's tag team title with Tony St. Clair and has a shooter rep and was a Greco-Roman champion before going pro, and Oleg Taktorov vs. Ryushi Yanagisawa. The buy rate has to be considered a boon to those who think ECW, despite having limited television coverage, could make a mark on pay-per-view because ECW has more of a base audience in the US than Pancrase, which had no television exposure in this country whatsoever going into its first pay-per-view nor any names pushed as being involved in the show that had any marquee value. As evidenced by the reader's poll, the response here to the first Pancrase show was overwhelmingly positive, although not quite as enthusiastically positive as the thumbs-up percentage would indicate. The large majority enjoyed the show and gave it a thumbs-up, but the enthusiastic response such as for the first AAA show or for the best WWF and WCW shows or even the first UWFI and most UFC shows wasn't there, with most crediting the announcing of Ken Shamrock as being the high point of the show. Many of those who liked the show were still skeptical of its marketability in the US even though indicating they personally would order future events. A very different response when compared to the AAA show where the general consensus after the show was it was a style and wrestlers who could literally take the country by storm. Even more so than Jeff Blatnick on the third UWFI pay-per-view show or Mike Tenay on the When Worlds Collide show, Shamrock was the first announcer on a pro wrestling pay-per-view event whose work was the most important factor in an event being successful. Semaphore Entertainment Group could use two Ken Shamrocks for Pancrase, one to be the headline performer on the shows the other to announce the shows and get the matches over. If a second event is as successful as the first, a great deal of credit should be given to Shamrock's educational style of announcing on the first show. Semaphore Entertainment Group was happy the show came off as well as it did because the 128 house show was not of the level quality-wise of most Pancrase major shows. In regard to Pancrase and the comments made here last week, the idea for the first pay-per-view show was simply to present the Pancrase product and they're happy it came off with a positive response because they expect the majority of future shows to have superior match quality. There were no main event caliber matches on the pay-per-view except for the main event itself. The long-term idea is to cross-promote UFC and Pancrase but they feel they first have to get Pancrase over as something different on its own merits. It was Semaphore Entertainment Group's decision, and not one from pressure from the outside to have the parental discretion warning at the beginning of the show. The reason is that Semaphore Entertainment Group believes it's under so much scrutiny because of UFC that they don't want to provide enemies with ammunition such as claiming they held what some who don't watch the event could call a brutal fighting event from Japan and didn't even warn parents before the show started about the potential brutality. Another interesting note regarding the pay-per-view show and Shamrock's announcing came from a reader who had seen the same show when it was first broadcast on JIRA, a Tokyo cable station. While praising Shamrock's commentary, he noted the commentary was entirely different on the Japanese show which put far more emphasis on Minoru Suzuki's offensive moves, including talking about the near choke as if it were moments from the finish, the same spot Shamrock blew off as not being particularly dangerous, and also emphasized a kick Suzuki through which apparently left its mark on Frank Shamrock's face, which Ken Shamrock in English commentary also didn't emphasize. There were comments here that praised Shamrock's announcing in as far as educating the audience but felt his commentary was too biased in favor of the Americans, all of whom were his lion's den protégés. Brazilian Marco Ruiz has withdrawn from the May 17th UFC show in Detroit, believed to be over money, and has returned to Brazil. Ruiz is believed to have withdrawn from his match against Don Fry, the co-feature to the Shamrock vs. Dan Severn title match, because he was unhappy about the offered payoff, believed to have been in the $15,000 range. 
there have been numerous changes in regard to the structure of UFC within Semaphore Entertainment Group, the most important of which is that Campbell McLaren, who had been executive producer of the event, has been moved laterally within Semaphore Entertainment Group and is now president of a new division called Semaphore Entertainment Group Productions, which won't have anything to do with UFC or Pancrase. The UFC events will be run by Bob Marowitz, David Isaacs and Art Davey in regard to fighter selection and negotiations and a company called Earthquake Promotions will handle the marketing. The follow-up pay-per-view show on July 12th, tentatively booked for Providence, Rhode Island, will not have a Superfight Championship match and will only consist of a tournament, built as the tournament which will largely feature successful names already familiar to UFC fans as opposed to the last tournament which mainly featured newcomers. The Shamrock Severn winner will defend the Superfight title next on a September pay-per-view show, tentatively planned for Syracuse, New York, with a tournament on that show as well. Fry's new opponent will be Amari Bintetti, who recently captured the World Jiu-Jitsu Championship in the Absolute, Unlimited, weight class in Rio de Janeiro but has never fought previously in the United States. Bitetti had been scheduled to debut with UFC underneath as the new Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu star in a prelim match against Joe Charles, but has been moved into the semi-final. Bitetti recently placed second in the Brazilian National Valley Tudo Championship Tournament, in what was actually a major upset at the time. Bitetti, who also has experience in Muay Thai, a much more brutal in UFC form of almost anything goes kickboxing with no ground fighting, being the first BJJ stylist to lose in the finals of this type of competition to a stand-up fighter by foolishly not trying to take him down and instead choosing to slug it out with someone with more experience as a puncher, and suffered what was said to be one of the most brutal knockouts in Valley Tudo history as a result. Despite losing in his free fighting debut in Japan, Koji Kiao is still scheduled for the UFC with a contingent from Japan scheduled to come in to see that spectacle. A match added to the show is Rafael Carino, billed at 6-8, 250 from Rio de Janeiro against Lance Luper, billed at 6 foot 2, 340 from Texas. And finally, this is as much as we've got for the April 26th Extreme Fighting 2 pay per view show with 26th Extreme Fight Reservation, so as to avoid governmental interference so near Montreal. There will be fights in four weight classes. Alfonso Alcaraz will face someone to create an EFC Bantamweight, 139 pounds and under, champion. In the lightweight division, 140 to 159, it'll be Ralph Gracie versus Steve Nelson, the only pro wrestler entered, and John Lewis versus Melvin Murray, with the two winners meeting to determine a champion on the following pay-per-view event. Igor Zinoviev, who was the most impressive fighter on the first pay-per-view event, defends his middleweight title, 160 to 199, against Orlando Vite, a Muay Thai fighter who competed in UFC 2 winning a first-round match before being knocked out by Remco Pardul in the second round. The other middleweight match will have former collegiate wrestler Paul Jones of Amarillo, Texas, who placed second in the NCAA Division II Nationals in 1986 and 1987 at 177 pounds while attending University of Nebraska Omaha, against a question mark. The unlimited weight class has Marcus Conan Silvera defending his title against Carl Franks, who is the heavyweight champion of the now defunct Pancradion group out of Hawaii that was just banned, and Brian Johnston said to be a kickboxer and wrestler trained by Mike Swain, U.S. Olympic judo coach, versus Danielson Maia of Brazil. EFC's first pay-per-view was more memorable for the horrible announcing, by Mr. T in particular although Booker John Peretti came off as terribly annoying as well, schluck production, ridiculously fraudulent records, not that UFC has never done anything like that but never to that level, overall disorganization and one memorable main event fight with Zinovia versus Mario Sperry, it was the only shoot show in history to get a major thumbs down in an observer poll. It is believed that the competitors will all wear Kempo Karate gloves as in Japanese Valley Tudo rules rather than fight bare knuckle. Akira Tao pinned Steve Williams with his Nottawa choke slam in 21-41 to capture the 1996 Champion Carnival Tournament. Tao and Williams went to the finals of a very carefully booked tournament which drew a sellout 16,300 fans to Tokyo's Budokan Hall on April 20th. Going into the final week of the tournament, Stan Hansen, who had completed all his matches was in first place with 16 points. Tao, Williams, and Kenna Kobashi, all of whom had one match left, had 15 points with two points awarded for a victory and one for a draw. So they were actually all in better position. Both Tao and Williams clinched a spot in the finals on April 16th in Sakata with victories over Johnny Ace and Takao Amori respectively. This put Ace in the spoilers role on April 18th in Hiratsuka in the final match of the round-robin tournament against Kobashi, holding him to the 30-minute Broadway which left Kobashi with 16 points, 
tying him with Hansen and meets Suharu Masao for third and eliminating what most were expecting, the final night turning into a triangular affair. Tao, 34, debuted with All Japan in January of 1988 after being a mid-level star in the world of sumo, following in the footsteps of one of the biggest stars in the history of the All Japan promotion, Genichiro Tenryu, who was a big name in sumo before becoming an even more enduring major name in pro wrestling. Tao was pushed ahead of the more talented Kobashi, who started his career at about the same time, because he had the bigger name being a star from another sport, and also because his size and look made him almost a combination looks-wise of Giant Baba and Jumbo Tsurida, the two biggest names in All Japan's history. By 1990, after several wrestlers had jumped from All Japan causing a more rapid push than would be expected for the younger wrestlers, he was already Tsurida's regular tag team partner and on March 4, 1992, they captured their first world tag team title beating Steve Williams and Terry Gordy. Tao held the tag title on three more occasions including at present, all with Toshiaki Kawada. Even though Kobashi has never beaten Tao in a singles match, Tao has been considered by fans as the weakest member of All Japan's Big Four, since the other three are arguably the three best all-around in-ring workers in the business today. This has led to Tao getting a little more of a promotional push as far as wins compared with the other three to try and create parity on top in the eyes of the fans, who have their respect for the other three locked in no matter whether they win or lose based on their ability. This explains what would be thought of as a surprise win in the tournament after losing the championship match last year to Misawa. Because Japanese wrestling follows more sports logic than entertainment logic, it would have made no sense for Steve Williams, who returned on this tour after a one-year suspension, to win the carnival. From a sports standpoint, the fact Williams could come back after a layoff in a tournament with the best wrestlers in the business in their prime who have been working steadily and go to the finals was amazing enough, so he didn't have to win and his showing told the story that once he's back in the groove. He's a threat to everyone particularly since he handed Misawa his first pinfall loss in nearly two years during the round robin. The williams Tao match saw Tao survive Williams' Oklahoma stampede early. He also used a tiger suplex to stun Tao, who rolled out of the ring to regain his senses. Tao came back with a throw-out German suplex and used a DDT on the floor to gain a lengthy advantage. Williams made a comeback but was cut off by Tao's Nottawa, but Williams rolled out of the ring to save himself. Tao hit a tope and then used the dreaded Nottawa off the apron to the floor. When he threw Williams back in, Williams surprisingly kicked out. Williams ended up with another comeback including using both his backdrop driver and Dr. Bomb for near falls. Tao used his dynamic bomb for a near fall. As Williams went for a German suplex, while in the air, Tao kicked the turnbuckle so he fell backwards onto Williams. After a high kick to the face, Tao used the Nottawa for the finish. In what is believed to be pro wrestling's first lesbian moment, the latest chapter in the Beulah McGillicuddy slash Tommy Dreamer angle is that Beulah's pregnancy was a hoax and that she had been cheating on Dreamer with another of ECW's performers, women stripper type Kimono Wainalia. The latest climax of the angle took place on April 20th at the ECW Arena in Philadelphia. Shane Douglas handled the mic work explaining to Dreamer that Kimono had told him that the pregnancy was a hoax on Dreamer and Beulah had been cheating on him. When Dreamer asked what guy she was cheating with, Douglas said it wasn't a guy and then Beulah and Kimono embraced and did a lengthy lesbian kiss which naturally got a big pop. But good triumphed at the end as Dreamer, explaining that he's hardcore, ended up kissing both of them and leaving, teasing another new kind of a three-way dance. Pro wrestling will be the attraction at the final sports event at the 56-year-old Buffalo War Memorial Auditorium, which is being torn down this summer, in a WCW show that will pay tribute to former wrestler and famous local personality Elio Di Paolo, who died last May after being hit by an automobile while crossing the street. The show, entitled Wrestling Legends of the Odd, takes place on June 7th, and will include guest appearances by many of Di Paolo's friends, contemporaries, and former major stars that appeared in the building in the past, such as Bruno Sammartino, Dick Destroyer Bayer, Angelo Poffo, Billy Red Lions, Waldo Von Eric, Angelo Mosca, Chris Tolos, Sweet Daddy Siki, and Kurt Von Hess. In addition, former local favorites such as Dominic DiNucci, Tony Parisi, Gino Brito, and Dewey Robertson, as the missing link, are scheduled to work Legends matches on the undercard of the WCW event. It is believed to be the first pro wrestling show that Sammartino will have attended in several years, since his brief association with WCW under the Bill Watts regime. Di Paolo was a popular wrestler in the upstate New York area in the 50s and 60s, and later became even more famous as a restaurateur through his Ilio Di Paolo's restaurant and ringside lounge where he regularly housed team meals for the Buffalo Bills and became friends with many of the area's top athletes. His popularity in town was such that the local television stations broke into the local programming to report on his death last year. This is the first issue of the current four-issue set. 
If you've got A, 1, on your address label, it means your observer subscription expires in three weeks. Renewal rates within the United States, Canada and Mexico remain $8 for four issues, which includes $3 for postage and handling, $15 for $8, $22 for $12, $28 for $16, $42 for $24, $56 for $32 up through $70 for 40 issues. Rates for the rest of the world with the exception of the United Kingdom are $11 for four issues, which includes $6 for postage and handling, $21 for $8, $30 for $12, $50 for $20, $70 for $28 up through $100 for 40 issues. All subscription renewals except within the United Kingdom should be sent to the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, P.O. Box 1228, Campbell, California 95009122. All letters to the editor, reports from live shows and any other correspondence pertaining to this publication should also be sent to the above address including by those within the UK readers within the UK for fastest delivery should renew at Wrestling Observer Newsletter, 19 Alpha Road, Bulwark, Chepstow Gwen NP 65QX South Wales, United Kingdom. Subscription rates in pounds are 7.50 for 4, 15 for 8, 22.50 for 12 and 30 for 16. For those in the UK only, please make checks out to shoot fave rather than wrestling observer newsletter. Fax messages can be sent to the observer 24 hours a day at 408244-3402. Phone messages can be left 24 hours a day at 408244-2455. For the most up-to-date wrestling information, I can be reached every Monday, Wednesday and Friday on the Wrestling Observer Hotline 900-903-9030 slash 99 cents per minute. Children under 18 need parents' permission before calling, with a recorded news update. We also have updates on all pay-per-view events approximately 20 minutes after the conclusion of the event. Because there are two pay-per-view events this weekend, we'll have some minor programming changes. For the EFC show, I will be on option 5 rather than option 7, while Bruce Mitchell will be on option 8. For the WWF show, I'll be on the regular option 7 while Steve Beverly will be on option 8. In both cases, We'll immediately run down the results and major angles on the show for those calling for that reason before getting into details on the show. Besides myself, reports for the hotline are done by Steve Beverly, Friday, Saturday, Tuesday, Bruce Mitchell, Saturday, Thursday, Ron Lemieux, Sunday, Wednesday, Georgie M. Acropolis, Sunday, Mike Mooneyham, Monday, and Scott Hudson, Tuesday, Thursday, latter usually with results of WCW Saturday night tapings held the night before. Major events wrestling calendar April 26th to May 26th. April 26th Extreme Fighting Championships 2 Pay-Per-View Montreal, K. Zenovia vs. Fight April 26th Rings Osaka Furitsu Gym, Yamamoto vs. Kosaka April 28th WWF In Your House Pay-Per-View Omaha Nebraska Civic Center, Michaels vs. Diesel April 29th New Japan Tokyo Dome, Takata vs. Hashimoto April 29th WWF Monday Night Raw Taping Sioux City, Iowa, Michaels vs. Fader April 30th WWF Superstars Tapings Des Moines, Iowa, Michaels vs. Vader May 5th, FMW Kawasaki Baseball Stadium, Tanaka and Hayabusa vs. Terry Funk and Pogo May 6th, WCW Monday Nitro Tapings Daytona Beach, Florida Ocean Center, Giant vs. Luger May 11th, AAA Triple Mania 4 Chicago International Amphitheater, Conan and Ogueo vs. Pierroth and Karras May 11th, ECW Philadelphia ECW Arena, Douglas vs. Scorpio May 11th, All Japan Women WrestleMarine Piad 96 Yokohama Bunka Gym. Kyoko and Takako Inoue vs. Toyota and Shimoda May 13th WCW Monday Nitro Tapings Nashville, Tennessee Municipal Auditorium. May 16th Pancrase Brawl and Budokan Pay-Per-View Taping Tokyo Budokan Hall, Frank Shamrock vs. Rutan May 17th UFC 9 Pay-Per-View Detroit Kobo Arena, Ken Shamrock vs. Severn May 18th WWF Philadelphia Core State Spectrum, Michaels vs. Diesel May 18th UWFI New Japan Sapporo Nakajima Sports Center. May 18th Women's Multi-Promotional Joint Show Tokyo Oda Ward Gymnasium May 19th WCW Slamboree Pay-Per-View Baton Rouge Louisiana Riverside Centriplex Sting vs. Giant May 19th WWF New York Madison Square Garden Michaels vs. Diesel May 20th WCW Monday Nitro Taping Monroe Louisiana Civic Center May 25th Rings Ekaterinburg, Russia Yamamoto vs. Ramaji May 26th WWF In Your House Pay-Per-View Florence South Carolina Civic Center Michaels vs. Smith results. April 12th, Wayne, Michigan, Great Lakes Wrestling. 190 Bobby and Woody Lee B. Big Daddy Adams and Killer Keith, Mike Legacy B. Rico Rodriguez, Sexton Hardcastle B. Calavera Cortez, Terry Richards B. Mike Kelly, Tex Monroe B. Death Dealer, 
Steve Nixon B. El Fuego, Ray Roberts B.D. Low Brown. April 13, Nashville, USWA, 1100, Yoshi Kwan B. Tony Williams, Cyberpunk Ice D. Headbanger Mosh, Samantha B. Miss Texas, USWA Tag Titles, Cyberpunks B. Headbangers, Brian Christopher and Jesse James Armstrong B. Sir Mo and Reggie B. Fine, Mask vs. Van, Cyberpunk Fire B. Bill Dundee, April 13, Cleveland, Cleveland All Pro Wrestling, 250, Steve Nixon B. Johnny Swinger, Theater of Pain B. Dan and Doug Cannon, Scott Stone B. Brian Ireland, Bone Crusher Broke B. Canadian Bad Boy, Pain and Agony B. Knox Brothers, E. Low Brown B. Crusher Klein. April 13, Homa, Louisiana, Mid South Wrestling, 225, Young Bloods Not Original, NC Southern Patriots, Bronco Bob B. Steve Diamond, Shogun Warrior, Richie Valentine, B. Frankie Jeffrey, Tommy Rich B. Sandman Not Original, TJ Sullivan and Crazy Joe B. Halfbreed and Tasmaniac, Not Original, Coco Werby Joe Kane, Robbie Rage B. Debbie Combs. April 13, Alexandria, Virginia, Independent Pro Wrestling Alliance, 350, Earl the Pearl B. Johnny Dream, Bob Starby Lucifer, Johnny Graham B. Race Richards 3, Big Slam Vader, Walter McDonald, N.C. Abuda Singh, John Rickner, Corporal Punishment B. Quinn Nash, Jimmy Z. B. Brian Perry, Roger Anderson and Frank Parker B. Jimmy Cicero and Chris Stevenson, Booty Man, Ed Leslie, B. Jim Neidhart, Johnny Gunn B. Q. Ball Carmichael. April 13, Philadelphia, Tri-County Wrestling, 85, Insomnia B. Trent Acid, H.W. Star and J.R. Ryder B. Crazy Ivan and Chris Cree, Abdul Jihad B. Rafael Barrio, Dan Slade B. Bo Steele, Lost Boys B. Ivan and Cree, Twiggy Ramirez won four corners match. April 14, Thibodeau, Louisiana, Universal Wrestling Federation, 200, Brian Cobra B. Ken Timms, Billy Knight B. Cody Gunn, Bad Dog Rottweiler B. Rick Robley, Sam Houston and Charlie Norris B. Rod Price and Tim Brooks DQ, Street Fight, Terry Gordy B. Dick Murdoch. April 14, Rockland, ONT, Ottawa Pro Wrestling, 40, Lord Tarek and Jake Steele, B. Kid Grunge, Bruiser B. Psycho Migo, Kevin Love B. Michael Wildside, Purple Haze B. Predator, Dangerous Dan B. Guy Shuriel. April 15, Memphis, USWA, 1200, Ed Bangers B. David Haskins and Tony Williams, Tony Fault B. Corey Williams, USWA Women's Title, Samantha B. Miss Texas to win title, Mask at Stake, Cyberpunk Ice B. Tommy Rich, Band vs. Retirement Bill Dundee B. Cyberpunk Fire, Brian Christopher and Jesse James Armstrong and Moondogs B. Men on Mission and Reggie B. Fine and Brickhouse Brown, Unified Title, Jerry Lawler D. Jeff Jarrett 60 Minutes. April 16, Sakata, All Japan, 2350 Sellout, Tsuyoshi Kikuchi and Yoshinari Ogawa B. Kentaro Shiga and Satoru Asako, the Patriot and Doug Furness B. Masao Inoue and Ryukaku Izamida, Giant Baba and Rusher Kimura and Mitsuo Momoto B. Mighty Inoue and Haruka Igen and Masa Fuchi, Steve Williams B. Takawa Mori, Akira Tao B. Johnny Ace, Toshiaki Kaoda B. Tamon Honda, Mitsuharu Misawa and Kenna Kobashi and Jun Akiyama B. Stan Hansen and Gary Albright and Dan Crawford. April 16, Gatano, K. Ottawa Pro Wrestling, 140, Jake Steele B. Kid Grunge, Kevin Love B. Michael Wildside DQ, Purple Haze B. Predator, Paul Laser B. B. Bruiser, Guy Shuriel and Rene Bastian B. Dangerous Dan and Psycho Miko. April 17, Vera Cruz, AAA, 4000, Super Muñequito and Pantrita B. Espectritos 1 and 2, Tony Arce and Volcano and Rocco Valente B. Frisbee and Boomerang and Aguila Solitaria, Alcone Dorado Jr. and Mascara Sagrada Jr. and Teen Yablis Jr. and Blue Demon Jr. B. Los Piasos and Caras La Momia. La Parca in Mascara Sagrada and Octagon B. Los Villanos. April 18, Hiratsuka, All Japan, 2100, Masao Inoue and Mighty Inoue B. Monokia Mossman and Kentaro Shiga, Doug Furness B. Tsuyoshi Kikuchi, Giant Baba and Rusher Kimura and Mitsuo Momoto B. Ryukaku Izamaya and Haruka Aigen and Masa Fuchi, Steve Williams and Dan Crawford B. Akira Tao and Yoshinari Ogawa, Jun Akiyama B. The Patriot, Mitsuharu Misawa B. Takawa Mori, Kenta Kobashi D. Johnny Ace 30 Minutes, Stan Hansen and Gary Albright B. Toshiaki Kaoda and Tamon Honda. April 18th, Waltham, Massachusetts, American Wrestling Federation, 300, Antoine Roy B. Scott Taylor B. Bulldozer Corps, Steve Bradley B. Arctic Angel, Steve King, Annihilators B. Brian Walsh and Taylor, Rick Fuller B. Rick Martell DQ, Bam Bam Bigelow B. Tim McNeeny. April 18th, Hamamatsu Battlerts, 431, Axe Thunder Otsuka B. Satoshi Yoniyama, 
Paul Greco B. Takeshi Ono Riki Fuji and Takamichi no Ku and Shoichi Funaki B. Koji Nakagawa Naohiro Hoshikawa and Minoru Tanaka, Takashi Ishikawa B. Bat, Daisuke Ikeda B. Katsumi Yuzuda. April 18th Shelbyville, Tennessee, All-State Wrestling, Tony Falk B. Backwood Brawler Rex, Hot Chocolate B. Jason Vaughn, Gypsy Joe B. Mr. Biggs, Ben Mullins DDQ Kola Khan, Canon Keith Arden B. Shane Morton and Kid Sensation, Boogie Woogie Boy B. John Arden DQ. April 18th, Bakersfield, California. Flemmers, Jesus Zapata D. Dynamite D. Tyrone Little B. Samoan Kid. Dynamite D. B. Ombre de Oro, Vern Langdon B. Movie Star Mike DQ, Jeff Lindbergh B. Bruce Bodine. April 19th, Osaka Furitsu Gym, UWFI New Japan. 7,000 sellout Kyoshi Tamura B. Billy Scott, Tokumitsu Ishizawa B. Kazushi Sakuraba. Yoshihiro Takayama B. Tatsuhiro Takaiwa, Masahiro Kakihara B. Yuji Nagata, Tatsuo Nakano and Yuhi Sano, Naoki Sano, B. Kenichi Yamamoto and Yoji Anjo, Riki Chashu and Kensuke Sasaki B. Nobuiko Takata and Hiromitsu Kaneara. April 19th Sapporo Nakajima Sports Center, War, 5100, Osamu Teitoko B. Battle Ranger, Yuji Yasu Ryoka and Ultimo Dragon B. Damien and Lionheart, Big Titan B. Nobutaka Araya, Arashi and Koki Kitahara B. Masayoshi Motegi and Shinichi Nakano, Genichiro Tenryu B. Mr. Pogo Kor, Rei Mysterio Jr. B. Sikosis, War Six Man Titles, Hiramichi Fuyuki and Ghetto and Jado B. Masa Chono and Hiroyoshi Tenzan, and Hiro Saito 2022. April 19th, Plymouth Meeting, Pennsylvania, ECW. 350, Pit Bulls B. Bad Crew, Brian Lee N.C. Axel Rotten, Little Guido, Damian Stone, B. Hack Myers, Taz B. Mikey Whipwreck, ECW TV title, 2 Cold Scorpio D. Cebu, Shane Douglas and Sandman B. Billy Black and Rob Van Dam, ECW title Lumberjack match, Raven B. Tommy Dreamer. April 19th Mexico City Arena Mexico, EMLL Arena Mexico 40th Anniversary Show, Chicago Express and Archangel and Guerrero del Futuro B. Solar and Super Astro and Ringo Mendoza, Hair vs. Hair, Rambo B. Humberto Garza, El Hijo del Santo and Lismark and Atlantis B. Felino and El Satanico and Bestia Salvaje, Mil Mascaras and Tinieblas Sr. and Rio de Jalisco Jr. B. Kinect and Emilio Charles Jr. and Dr. Wagner Jr. DQ. April 19th Naha, Okinawa All Japan Women, Sai Endo B. Tiny Mouth, Genkei Misai B. Yumi Fukawa Asuko Mitai and Yumiko Hata B. Kumiko Makawa and Yoshiko Tamura, Tashio Yamada and Kyoko Inoue B. Reggie Bennett and Tomoka Watanabe, Minami Toyota and Mariko Yoshida B. Mima Shimoda and Takako Inoue. April 19th, Reading, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Championship Wrestling, Double Delight B. Mark Mest and Max Crimson, Reckless Youth B. Don Montoya, Doink the Clown B. Nikolai Volkov, Jimmy Deo B. D. LeBrown, Bob Backlund B. Dave Keller, Julio Sanchez and Shane Shadows and DZ Gillespie B. Johnny Graham and Troy Mest and Juggernaut, Akita Chaos B. Race Richards, Dale One Battle Royal, Richards and Chaos B. Mark Mest and Crimson. April 19th, Rego Park, New York, Ultimate Championship Wrestling, 250, Leon Del Ring B. Rio de Plata, Gino Caruso B. Makumo DQ, Faro B. Intruder, Tommy Cairo B. Crazy Ivan, Shark Attack Kid B. Black Panther, Mike and Rick Matrix B. Blitzkrieg and Kodiak Bear, Tiger Khan B. Tank Reed. April 19th, Nacogdoches, Texas, World Class Wrestling Federation, Mr. Wrestling, Dusty Wolf, B. Tarzan Taylor, Austin Rhodes B. Black Bart DQ, Tugboat Taylor B. Mad Dog, Bullman Downs B. Chaz Taylor, GQ Knight and Dan Davis be Bobby Dancing and Chance, Mark Von Eric, Rick Larabus, be Humongous. April 19th, Rome, Georgia, North Georgia Wrestling Alliance, Nasty Critter be Apollo, Sunset Sam McGraw SMW Punisher, be Bull Ladu, Demon Master be Kenny D, Jailhouse Rocker, Daryl Gower, be Jason Valentine, Ken and John Arden be Steve Lawler and Bubba Humphreys. April 19th, Rossville, Georgia, TWA, Scott James and Outpatient be Frankie Lee and Samurai Dragon, Richie Dye and Woody Woodchuck be Johnny Quaz and Mr. Payne, Jimmy Sharp and C. Randy Watkins, Joel Travis and New One Man Gang be Rick Justice and Chuck Colt DQ, Michael Collins be Risk Taylor. April 19th Harlock, North Carolina, All-Star Wrestling, 250, Billy Simmons be Thunderfoot, Gary Royal be Big Cheese, Sal Corrente, David Isley and Debbie Combs be Rick Link and Robbie Rage, Terry Taylor be Ricky Nelson, Nelson won blindfold battle royal. April 20th Tokyo Budokan Hall All Japan, 16,300 sellout, Tsuyoshi Kikuchi be Mighty Inoue 917, Haruka Aigen and Ryukaku Izumaida be Rusher Kimura and Mitsuo Momoto 1415, 
Dan Crawford and Doug Furness be Manukia Mossman and the Patriot 1215. Yoshinari Ogawa and Masafuchi and Masao Inoue be Kentaro Shiga and Satoru Asako and Giant Baba 2733, Stan Hansen and Jumbo Tsurida be Takawa Mori and Tamon Honda 836, Toshiaki Kawada and Gary Albright and Johnny Ace be Mitsuharu Masawa and Kenta Kobashi and Jun Akiyama 1947, Champion Carnival Final, Akira Taubi Steve Williams 2141. April 20th Bayreuth Germany WWF 3637, Bushwhackers and Duke Dries be 123 Kid and Leif Cassidy and Isaac Yankem, Justin Bradshaw be Savio Vega, Arm Wrestling, Ahmed Johnson be Davy Boy Smith DQ, WWF Tag Titles, Buddy Donna's be Godwins, Jake Roberts be Owen Hart DQ, Razor Ramon be Bradshaw, Bret Hart be Hunter Hearst Helmsley, Undertaker be Diesel, WWF Title, Shawn Michaels be Steve Austin. April 20th Philadelphia ECW Arena, ECW 1075 Sellout, Supernova NCL Puerto Rican O Dud, Mikey Whipwreck B Billy Black 2 and a half stars, Pitbulls NC Bubba Ray Dudley and D Von Dudley 1 and 1 half star, Taz B Devon Storm Core 2 stars, Axel Rotten B Little Guido 1 and 3 quarter stars, Sandman and 2 Cold Scorpio B Bruise Brothers 3 stars, Brian Lee B Tommy Dreamer 2 and a half stars, Sabu B Rob Van Dam 4 and 1 quarter stars, ECW title, Raven B Shane Douglas 3 stars. April 20th Hakodate, WAR, Lion Heart B Battle Ranger, Shinichi Nakano B Osamu Teitoko, Yuji Asurioka B Masaaki Mochizuki, Ultimo Dragon and Rei Mysterio Jr. B Damian and Psychosis, Rashi B Big Titan, Genichiro Tenryu and Koki Kitahara and Nobutaka Araya B Hiramichi Fuyuki and Ghetto and Jado. April 20th Itaman, Okinawa All Japan Women, 2130, Yankee Misai B Yoshiko Tamura, Reggie Bennett and Kumiko Makawa and Saya Endo and Tiny Mouth B Mima Shimoda and Shaparita Asari and Yumi Fukawa in Yukashina, Okinawa Island Tag Tourney Semifinals, Marco Yoshida and Manami Toyota B Atsuko Mitai and Yumiko Hata, Tashio Yamada and Kyoko Inoue B Asia Kong and Kaoru Ito, Takako Inoue B Tomoka Watanabe, Tag Tourney Finals, Toyota and Yoshida B Yamada and T Inoue. April 20th Niigata, Tokyo Pro Wrestling, 756, Astro Jr. B. Mr. Niebla, Akihiko Masuda D. Toryu, Tenikabo A.K. B. Masanobu Kurisu, Deko and Sakikage B. Shocker and Alko Negro, Mr. Pogo B. Masashi Aoyagi, Abdullah the Butcher and Great Kabuki and Daiko Kubo Benke B. Takashi Ishikawa and Kishin Kawabata and Shigeo Okamura. April 20th Kasimi, Florida, Southeastern Championship Wrestling, 300, DJ Hunter B. Blade Runner, Randy Starr B. Tony Mulkey, Lil Tiger B. Rattler Red, Al Hardeman B. Slick Willie, Rick Ryder B. Bob Cook, Cliff and Terry Anderson B. Hitman, Rockin' Hill Billy B. Kevin Sullivan DQ, Dick Slater B. American Samurai. April 20th Anniston, Alabama, Dixieland Championship Wrestling, 225, Lee Pete B. Commando, Mr. Tennessee, Larry Santo B. Flamingo Kid, Joey Mags Ker Lieutenant Nasty, Brad Armstrong B. Randy Barber, the Bullet, Bob Armstrong. B. Tennessee DQ, Alan Martin B. David Lee. April 20th Buchanan, West Virginia, Steel City Wrestling, 157, T. Ranchula B. Lou Marconi, Ninja Turtle, Brian Hildebrand, B. Cody Michaels, Benson Lee, Grant Miller, B. Masahiro Panic, Frank Stiletto B. Batman, T.C. Reynolds, DQ, Preston Steele B. Iron Sheik, Coco Where B. Lord Zoltan. April 20th Salisbury Beach, Massachusetts, Century Wrestling Alliance, Tony Rumble B. Big Dick Lano, Johnny Angel B. Prankster, Joel Davis B. Skull, Motor City Kingpin B. Big City Mike Core, Sunny C. B. Knuckles Nelson, El Mascarado, Bert Centeno, The Omega, Paul Zine B. Pink Assassin. April 20th Fort Myers, Florida, Sunshine Wrestling Federation, 300, Andre Moore B. Punk Rock, Isla Brothers B. J.R. James and Butch Long, Johnny Torres B. Larry Lane, Demon Hellstorm B. Executioner, Gator B. Long B. Johnny Evans, Cuban Assassin DDQ Hellstorm, Long One Battle Royal. April 20th Gore, Georgia, North Georgia Wrestling Alliance, Cameron Colt B. Scott Prodder, Dino Stone B. John Arden, Ken Arden B. Jamie Kyle, Mr. Olympia and Adriano B. Wrestling Kid and Sergeant Poison DQ, Dusty Dotson and Nasty Critter B. Mark Payne and Kitty Go. April 20th Indianapolis, Pro Wrestling International, Austin and Dallas James B. Trash Losigan and Quicksilver, Madman Pondo D. Johnny Walker, Jimmy Jack Hammer B. Billy the Kid, Arthur B. Gambler, Luzigan NC Sergeant Nelson, Quicksilver B. Austin James, 
Walker B. Pondo DQ, Nelson and Gambler B. Luzigan and Hearthrob, Austin and Dallas James DDQ Heavy Construction. April 20th Chattanooga, Tennessee, ABWF, 128, Stan Westmoreland B. Mr. X, Billy Montana B. Kevin Walker, Glamour Boy B. Black Patriot, Paul Jones and Mike Mercedes B. Killer Kent and Prince R, Johnny Blaze B. Jimmy Sharp, Richie Dye B. Black Terminator DQ. April 20th Windsor, Georgia, Great American Wrestling Federation, 50, Scarecrow B. Butcher, Ricky Rocket B. Martial Law, Dr. Dan and Orderly B. Stan Brown and J.D. Sullivan, KC Thunder B. Mike Murphy, Georgia Express B. Terminator Rex and Carolina Heartbreaker DQ. April 20th Central City, Kentucky, Tri-State Wrestling, Tim Pritchard B. Super Ninja, Mac Daddy B. Mark Gordy, Bob Ralston D. Medic, Debbie Combs D. Robbie Rage, Matt the Lumberjack B. New Dog. April 20th Dibal, Texas, World Class Wrestling Federation, Chaz Taylor B. Tarzan Taylor, Stacey King B. Black Bart DQ, Bowman Downs B. Tugboat Taylor, Mr. Wrestling and GQ Knight B. Bobby Dancing and Chance, Mark Von Eric N.C. Humongous. April 21st, Tokyo Karakuen Hall, FMW. 2150 sellout. Horace Boulder and Hisakatsu Oya v. Tetsuhiro Kuroda and Gasaku Goshigawara. Jason the Terrible v. Boogeyman. Bad Nurse Nakamura and Shark Tsuchiya and Crusher Maidamari v. Aki Kanbayashi and Kaori Nakayama and Megumi Kudo. Takamichi Noku and Riki Fuji v. Mak Hayato and Shooter Combat Toyota D. Jaguar Yokota Independent Junior Title. Koji Nakagawa B. Shoichi Funaki, Headhunters B. Masato Tanaka and Katsutoshi Niyama, Street Fight, Hideki Hasaka and Haido and Wing Kanemura B. Crypt Keeper and Shoji Nakamaki and Super Leather. April 21st Ginoan, Okinawa, All Japan Women, 2250, Saya Endo and Yuka Shina B. Tiny Mouth and Ginkei Misai, Shaparita Asari and Yumi Fukawa B. Yoshiko Tamura and Kumiko Maikawa, Mariko Yoshida B. Atsuko Mita, Kyoko Inoue and Takako Inoue B. Tashio Yamada and Mima Shimoda. All Pacific Title, Yumiko Hatabi Reggie Bennett, Asia Kong and Tomoko Watanabe B. Manami Toyota and Kaoru Ito. April 21st, Toyura at War, 1100 Sellout, Battle Ranger B. Damian. Lionheart B. Masa Akimochizuki, Yuji Yasu Ryoka and Arashi D. Masayoshi Motegi and Shinichi Nakano 20 Minutes, Rei Mysterio Jr. and Ultimo Dragon B. Sikosis and Ghetto. Big Titan B. Osamu Teitoko, Hiramichi Fuyuki and Jado B. Nobu Taka Araya, and Koki Kitahara. April 21st Niigata, Tokyo Pro Wrestling, Mr. Niebla B. Alcone Negro, Toru B. Masanobu Kurisu, Sakikage B. Tenekabo Ike, Shocker and Gekko B. Astro Jr. and Akiiko Masuda, Rate Kabuki and Daiko Kubo Benke B. Shigeo Okamura and Masashi Aoyagi, Abdullah the Butcher and Mr. Pogo B. Takashi Ishikawa and Kishin Kawabata. April 21st Tokyo Karakuen Hall, JWP, 1500 Karakuen Hall Tag Title Tourney, Yuki Miyazaki and Tomoko Kuzumi B. Fuseo Nauchi and Saburo, Tomoko Miguchi and Rieko Amano B. Kanako Matoya and Boyashoi Kid, Kuzumi and Miyazaki B. Amano and Miyaguchi to become first champions, Devil Masami B. Mayumi Ozaki, 2 on 3 handicap match, Ikari Fukuoka and Kandi Akutsu and Hiromi Yagi B. Dynamite Kansai and Kyuti Suzuki, April 21st Edgewood, Pennsylvania, Steel City Wrestling, 498 Batman B. Shadow, Paul Atlas B. Grim Reaper, P.A. Briggs D. Sean Evans, Ninja Turtle and Benson Lee B. Masahiro Panic and J.B. Destiny, Stevie Richards and Blue Meanie B. Frank Stiletto and Lou Marconi, Coco Ware B. Iron Sheik, Lord Zoltan and T. Rantula and Psycho Mike B. Cody Michaels and Preston Steele and Dynamite Dean, Dean 1 Battle Royal. Special thanks to James Huss, Adam Pennison, Kevin Halbronner, Kevin McKenzie, Ken Doucet, Greg John, James Titus, John Muse, Dominic Valenti, Peggy Watkins, Bart Orkline, Sarah Moore, Dan Paris, Greg Klein, Nezaba Mario, Matt Langley, Rich Palladino, Bernard Siegel, Norm Connors, Jesse Money. Japanese Television Rundown April 5th New Japan 1. Kazuo Yamazaki made Masa Chono submit in 12-15. The match didn't have a lot of heat, but it did have logic to it. Chono used a figure four early and Yamazaki sold it the rest of the way making his most powerful weapons, his kicks, less effective. Chono used a power bomb and as he went to posture to the crowd, Yamazaki trapped the arm in a cross arm breaker which was a great finish. Two stars. 2. Hiroyoshi Tenzan pinned Osamu Nishimura in 9.59 with a Samoan drop and Boston Crab submission. Nishimura did every suplex in the book for near falls before losing. 3 stars. 3. 
Shinya Hashimoto and Junji Hirata retained the IWGP tag titles beating Harlem Heat in 1441. Stevie Ray was just awful, as was the match overall. Booker T did some nice moves but couldn't sustain anything. Most of the match was Hirata working with them and it was bad. Hashimoto got the hot tag and they went right to the finish. Booker T kicked his brother and then Hashimoto hit T with a leg lariat and pinned him after a brainbuster. Three quarters of a star. 4. Shinjiro Otani pinned Wild Pegasus in 1809 to become the first WCW Cruiserweight Champion. The crowd was kind of dead in the first half of the match although the work was good. The crowd finally got into it when Pegasus used three German suplexes in a row and Otani kicked out. Pegasus used a superplex off the top and then a diving headbutt off the top and Otani kicked out again. Pegasus clotheslined him literally out of his boots and Otani kicked out. Finally Pegasus used his killer power bomb and Otani after kicking out, rolled out of the ring to get his head together. Pegasus set him up for a pile driver off the top but Otani blocked it and eventually drop kicked Pegasus off the top to the back. Otani finally got the pin with a springboard into a DDT in mid-ring where he planted him. Excellent finishing sequence. This was just a hair below the match of the year level of the Otani Liger match but still excellent in its own right. Four and a half stars. April 13th. New Japan. 1. Tokumitsu Ishizawa beat Yuji Nagata to win the Young Lions tournament in the finale in 1227. Super stiff. Ishizawa is pretty green, but he does a Brazilian jiu-jitsu submission artist gimmick that allows him to overcome it with the right opponent that knows how to work with it. Fortunately, Nagata is just that because he did an excellent job carrying Ishizawa to a damn good match. Finish was excellent, as Nagata was going for a dragon suplex but Ishizawa got behind him on his shoulders and trapped the arm in a cross arm breaker for the submission. 3 and 1 half stars. 2. The rest of the show were first round matches from the one night tag tourney. Hashimoto and Hirata beat Scott Norton and Hugh Morris in 850 when Hashimoto pinned Morris with a DDT. 2 and a half stars. 3. Keiji Muto and Kensuke Sasaki beat Yoji Anjo and Yoshihiro Takayama in 1050 when Sasaki made Takayama submit to the power strangle. Takayama stinks and held the match down a lot. 2 stars. 4. Chono and Tenzon beat Riki Chashu and Satoshi Kojima in 1221 when Chono pinned Kojima after two Yakuza kicks. Kojima bled from the mouth from a stiff Yakuza kick midway through the match. 1 and 3 quarter stars. 5. Tatsumi Fujinami and Shiro Koshinaka beat Genichiro Tenryu and Nobutaka Araya in 1404. Fujinami and Tenryu slapped the hell out of each other. It was really clear Araya wasn't in the league with the rest of the guys. He was out of position for spots and outright blew other spots. The other three worked well, which is saying something considering Fujinami and Tenryu are limited these days being well past their prime although Fujinami physically looks in great shape for a 42-year-old. Fujinami finally caught Araya with a dragon sleeper for the submission. 3 stars. Champion Carnival Finals History 1973, Giant Baba beat Mark Lewin. 1974, Giant Baba beat Mr. Wrestling, Tim Woods. 1975, Giant Baba beat Gene Kineski. 1976, Abdullah the Butcher beat Giant Baba via DQ. 1977, Giant Baba beat Jumbo Surita. 1978, Giant Baba beat Abdullah the Butcher. 1979, Abdullah the Butcher beat Jumbo Surita. 1980, Jumbo Surita beat Dick Slater. 1981, Giant Baba beat Bruiser Brody. 1982, Giant Baba won via points in round robin. Bruiser Brody, Jumbo Surita, and Ted DiBiase tied for second place. 1983, 90 no tournament held. 1991, Jumbo Surita beat Stan Hansen. 1992, Stan Hansen beat Mitsuharu Misawa. 1993, San Hansen beat Mitsuharu Misawa. 1994, Toshiaki Kaoda beat Steve Williams. 1995, Mitsuharu Misawa beat Akira Tao. EMLL Chrismo Productions was bringing in EMLL Wrestling to New York City with shows on April 26th and April 28th at the Armory Center in Jamaica, Queens. Among the wrestlers listed as appearing on the shows in Mexican magazines include El Hijo del Santo, Solar, Scorpio Sr., Los Brazos, Pirata Morgan, Robin Hood, Rey Mysterio, Angel O Demonio, Women Lady Apache, La Diabolica, and Mini Zorito and Felinito. The major show of the week was April 19th, billed as the 40th anniversary show at Arena Mexico. The actual first wrestling card at Arena Mexico was April 26, 1956, so this Friday's show would be the 40th anniversary technically, so I'm not certain whether or not this is a two week celebration. 
They brought back many of the legends to sit ringside for the show including Blue Demon and Ray Mendoza, who actually is around at most of the shows since he heads the local commission, and brought Mil Mascaras, Kanek and Tiniables Sr. in for the main event. We don't have a crowd figure other than an estimate of about 7,500. As far as response, well, let's just say Mascara's return wasn't nearly as well received as the Ultimate Warriors and the match was horrible. Mascara's, who according to our records would be 57 years old, his official listed age is 53, teamed with Tiniebles Sr., who, like Mascara's, was a Mexican cinema star in the mid to late 60s and early 70s and later a kids' television show personality, and Rio de Jalisco Jr. to beat Kanek and Dr. Wagner Jr. and Emilio Charles Jr. via DQ when Kanek pulled off Rio's mask. The other key matches were El Hijo del Santo and Lismark and Atlantis over Felino and El Satanico and Bestia Salvaje in a match that wasn't good either, and Rambo beat Humberto Garza in a hair match in which the combined time for all three falls was less than six minutes. Obviously they are building up Rambo's hair for Humberto's brother Hector, who is the promotion's current golden boy. The highlight of the TV show was said to be still photos of legends of the past from Arena Mexico with them talking about them. AAA the Texas dates scheduled for May 17th in San Benito and May 18th in San Antonio have been canceled when the local promoters backed out. Tickets for the Triple Mania in Chicago should be on sale before you read this. Even though the first Triple Mania is now only three weeks ago, the television and booking still seems to be lacking any focus or direction. Lineup for June 15th in Los Angeles at the Olympic Auditorium is tentatively Conan and Pero Agueo, and unknown could be Eddie Guerrero depending upon his WCW booking schedule WCW doesn't have a show that night but it's the night before a pay-per-view in Baltimore versus Jerry Estrada and CN Carras and Pierre Roth Jr. Psicosis and Juventud Guerrero defending Iwas tag titles against Rey Mysterio Jr. and Pantera Damian versus Octagon for Iwas light heavyweight title La Parca and Ultimo Dragon and Super Clo versus Cybernetico and Heavy Metal and Halloween plus locals underneath the major house show of the week was April 17th in Veracruz before 4,000 fans as Mascara Sagrada and Octagon and Parca beat Los Villanos. After the match, Jason the Terrible from FMW showed up and attacked the faces. Jason, who lives in Australia, was in trying to work out an agreement with AAA to where he would try and get AAA television on in Australia and then he'd promote tours there. And the April 18th Jalapa show which drew a sellout of about 3,200 ended up being changed from a heavyweight title match with Ogueo defending against Cibernetico to a non-title cage match. So plans for the title switch were changed, which was reported as being a horrible match even with all the young guys interfering to attempt to save it. April 21st in Pachuca drew a sellout 3,000 headlined by a Four Corners tag team match which is called in Mexico Relevos Tijuana, because it debuted in Mexico a few months back in Tijuana, with heavy metal and super crazy, Conan and Torero, Viano 4 and Angel Blanco Jr. and Mascara Sagrada Jr. and Octagon. It came down to Sagrada Jr. versus Conan and Conan put Sagrada Jr. over in the middle with the idea that it would create a new star, but it backfired as the fans didn't accept it because Sagrada Jr.'s offense leaves much to be desired and everyone can readily see he's not ready for this push. The semifinal was a lumberjack strap match which had nothing but face lumberjacks with belts as two heel teams, Los Payasos vs. Los Destructors wrestled. They did comedy spots as well as Gato Montini, a local heel ref, kept getting thrown outside the ring to the lumberjacks with belts whenever Pepe Casas got mad at him. A lot due to the influence of Dragon, expect to see another style change to a combination of a lucha style and a Japanese submission style. Dragon, who is only 29, is broken down and always in pain from the years of heavy flying, and also of not taking time off to heal his repeated ankle injuries, and has especially preached to Psychosis and Rey Mysterio Jr., who are now in Japan for war, about using more submissions and saving the flying moves for spots in order to extend their careers. The Tijuana shows are also going to get away from such a heavy ECW influence and do more of a mix of Japanese submission style with AAA style and some ECW influence. Conan is the only wrestler still suspended from Norte, California, however due to political pressure, the commission is allowing him to wrestle on April 30th in Mexicali for Kids Day. He's under a three-month suspension but the suspensions for Pierre Roth Jr., Octagon and Heavy Metal were all lifted. Basically at the hearing where some of the local wrestlers suspended when the commission suspended the entire crew for holding an impromptu lumberjack match, all pointed the finger at Conan as telling them to use the chairs and to do the brawling. Triple A does have a Tijuana show on April 26 with Sagrada and Latin Lover and Team Yablis Jr. vs. Fishman and Killer and Karras on top. Rey Mysterio ran a show on April 19th in Tijuana drawing 349 paid with Hector Garza and Vampiro as the top draws. Speaking of Dragon, 
He's seriously considering quitting war both because the style of the younger wrestlers he works with like Lionheart, Ghetto, etc. is too hard on his body and also because he hasn't been given a raise since he went there, and has considered going to either Tokyo Pro Wrestling or Pro Wrestling Fujiwara Gumi since he'd be able to heavily tone down his matches with those groups. Mickey Ibaragi, who ran two tours of his own Wings promotion last year using mainly ECW wrestlers and was the original Wings promoter before that group went out of business, is talking about starting up and using AAA wrestlers as his draws. AAA hasn't extensively worked with Japan largely because of relations with Black Cat of New Japan, however New Japan hasn't used AAA wrestlers since November 1994 and they've turned down several groups to keep relations strong with New Japan and it appears people are tired of waiting, which also explains Mysteria Jr. and Psychosis on tour with War. And again, given all the organization and communication headaches, one could easily see why New Japan wouldn't even bother. Only major show of this coming week is April 28th in Karetero with an eight-woman battle royal inside a cage which includes the return to AAA of La Monster, formerly Bertha Fay in WWF, Pantera Serena and Martha Villalobos, and a welterweight title match which will have to save the show since there's nothing else worth a crap on it, with Mysterio Jr. defending against Guerrera. All Japan. Besides the Akira Tao winning the carnival match, also at Budokan Hall on April 20th saw Toshiaki Kawada and Gary Albright in Johnny Ace beat meet Suharu Misawa in Kenta Kobashi and Jun Akiyama, and Jumbo Tsurita who is now working as a college professor, returned to team with Stan Hansen over Tamon Honda and Takao Omori. The longest match on the show, which went 27-33 saw Yoshinari Ogawa and Masa Fuchi and Masao Inoue beat Kentaro Shiga and Satoru Asako and Giant Baba when Ogawa pinned Shiga. In the second match on the card which was a tag with the washed-up comedy guys, Haruka Aigen and Ryukaku Izamida beat Rusher Kimura and Mitsuo Momoto with the story here being it was the first time ever since these matches started and they've been around seemingly forever, that Aigen has ever pinned Kimura. Final carnival standings were, Tao 8-1-3, and 3, 19 points. Steve Williams 7-2-3, 17 points. Kobashi 7-2-2, 16 points. Hansen 7-2-2, 16 points. Misawa 7 2 and 2, 16 points. Kawada 6 2 and 3, 15 points. Albright 5 4 and 2, 12 points. Ace 3 5 and 3, 9 points. The Patriot 3 8 and 0, 6 points. Akiyama 2 8 and 1, 5 points. Amori 1 10 and 0, 2 points. And Honda 0 10 and 1, 1 point. All Japan will be down now for almost another month with the next tour from May 17th to June 7th with the major shows being two consecutive nights in Sapporo on May 23rd and May 24th, and the tour ending with a show at Budokan Hall. Stan Hansen will miss the tour which will be the first tour Hansen hasn't been on since the January tour of 1990. There have been a few tours where Hansen hasn't been on the entire tour but no tour since that time where he hasn't at least appeared on the big shows of the tour. Not sure of the reason, although it is time to move him to the middle of the card even though Hansen probably has to rank as the all-time most popular American wrestler ever to work Japan. On the tour will be the other regulars Williams, Albright, Patriot, Ace, Dan Crawford and Doug Furness plus Bobby Fulton, Tommy Rogers, the lacrosse, Jim Steele, and Giant Kimala. April 16th in Sakata before a sellout 2,350 in carnival results saw Williams pin Amori with a Dr. Bomb in 634 to clinch a spot in the finals, Tao over Ace in 1943 with Anatoa to clinch his spot in the finals and Kauda pinned Honda with a power bomb. Final show of the round robin was April 18th in Hiratsuka before 2,100 as Akiyama pinned Patriot, Masawa pinned Amori in 1023 with a Tiger driver and Kobashi and Ace went to the 30-minute draw. Judging from the magazine photos, the tour itself was brutal, as Kawada and Williams were both using the dangerous backdrop driver and there are photos of Misawa, Kobashi and Akiyama literally taking the fall almost and in a case or two not even almost on their head. In addition, Tao, Williams and Misawa all had their faces marked up and hard way cuts, there is no such thing as blading in all Japan, from their eyes because they work so stiff. After his 30-minute draw with Kawada on April 14th, Misawa had a cut above his right eye, on the right side of his mouth and also had his chin split open and there was blood streaming from all three spots so the right side of his face looked like a red road map. Considering all the other stuff, from the photos it appeared to be the match of the tour. April 21st TV show did a 2.7 rating. New Japan. No word on the Tokyo Dome advance other than it is expected to sell out, 
but wasn't sold out as of the middle of the past week. The only show of the past week was a UWFI show on April 19th at Osaka Furitsu Gym which drew a sellout 7,000 for the first clash of Nobuiko Takata vs. Riki Chashu in 8 years. Chashu teamed with Kensuke Sasaki to beat Takata and Hiromitsu Kaneyara when Sasaki pinned Kaneyara after a lariat and powerbomb in 1040. The biggest story coming out of the match was at the 7 minute mark, when Takata tagged in to go against Chashu for the second time, Takata hit Chashu with a barrage of kicks, including a knee to the chin which knocked out 5 of Chashu's front teeth. Better not let 2020 get a tape of that or states will try and ban pro wrestling. UWFI announced major shows for May 27th at Budokan Hall and June 26th at Nagoya Rainbow Hall. April 13th TV show only did a 1.2 rating which is particularly disappointing considering that it was Tatsumi Fujinami's first television match in more than one year and that Genichiro Tenryu was one of his opponents. In Japan, TV ratings seem to not have anywhere near the importance to the company as packing the houses as compared with the US, in which the business because of TBS ownership of WCW, is almost entirely ratings driven. Other Japan Notes Abdullah the Butcher debuted for Tokyo Pro Wrestling on April 20th in Joetsu teaming with Great Kabuki and Daiko Kubo Benkei to beat Takashi Ishikawa group owner, and Kishin Kawabata and Shige Okamura in the main event which drew 756 fans. After the match, Butcher and Mr. Pogo announced formation of a tag team and they challenged to Ishikawa and Yoji Anjo for the TPW tag team titles. However, that team was short-lived, as on Butcher's second show, on April 21st in Niigata, he and Pogo faced Ishikawa and Kawabata. Butcher basically got to do all the things he was banned from doing in New Japan rings, including attacking the ring announcer with a kendo stick, using a knife and fork to juice Kawabata, while Pogo used a kitchen sink and a chainsaw as foreign objects. Ishikawa came back using a chair on Butcher who also juiced. Butcher wasn't allowed to do his blood act for the past few years in all Japan. After the match, Abdullah attacked Toryu, a Japanese rookie who is the protege of Pogo, which led to Pogo then attacking Butcher and challenges being issued back and forth. However, the two still have another tag match on April 28th to go through with. Abdullah said that he would return in May and bring himself his own regular tag team partner at that point. War drew 5,100 in Sapporo on April 19th for a triple main event show. The finale saw Hiramichi Fuyuki and Geto and Jado retain the war six-man titles beating the New Japan trio of Masa Chono and Hiroyoshi Tenzan, and Hiro Saito. Fuyuki came to the ring with a bunch of bananas and got on the mic saying the challengers were three monkeys. When they came out, Fuyuki tried to mock them by giving them the bananas while Geto and Jado gave bananas to the ringside fans. Finish saw Chono accidentally hit Saito with the Yakuza kick and he was triple power bombed for the pin in 2022. Ghetto and Jado and Fuyuki's next title defense will be May 26th in Yokohama Bunka Gym against Anjo and Yoshihiro Takayama and Kenichi Yamamoto. After the match when Fuyuki announced that match, he said that he was bringing 100 eggs and would wash their dirty faces with eggs before wrestling them. The semifinal saw Rei Mysterio Jr. starting his first Japanese tour, he appeared for one match in December as part of the Super J Cup show, pinning Psychosis, while Tenryu and Pogo worked third from the top. That match was strange, with Pogo using a chainsaw to juice Tenryu. He set up the spot where he was to blow fire out of his mouth, but was stopped by Koki Kitahara. Tenryu made the comeback with the hard punches and chops and Pogo ran from the ring, through the back, and took a taxi from the building to his hotel room. War also ran on April 21st with Mysterio Jr. and Ultimo Dragon beating Ghetto and Psychosis. War has booked Tokyo Sumo Hall for shows on both July 20th and July 21st, one of which looks to be headlined by the first ever meeting of Takata vs. Tenryu in a singles match. FMW ran Karakuen Hall on April 21st drawing a sellout 2150 with lots of local hype that Atsushi Onita would appear at the show. After the headhunters beat Katsutoshi Niyama and Masato Tanaka, Onita came out wearing a suit and got into the ring and thanked the fans for their continued support of FMW. At this point, the headhunters and Nakamaki came out and Nakamaki challenged Onita. When Nakamaki first broke into pro wrestling after making something of a name for himself, as an author of a ball four type baseball exposed book, Onita used to give him horrific beatings. Rather than answer the challenge, Onita simply went back to the dressing room, Onita later said that he would be at ringside for the Kawasaki Baseball Stadium show on May 5 to see the Combat Toyota vs. Megumi Kudo explosive barbed wire match, but promised he would never attend another FMW show after that card. He also gave back his World Brass Nux belt and said that after the stadium show he would have no more involvement in FMW. Onita was really over with the fans this time, 
unlike the last time he came to Karakuen Hall because fans thought he was going to do an angle to break his retirement. Cactus Jack, in his real last match with the name, versus Mitsuhiro Matsunaga is said to be a definite in the King of the Death matches bout at the stadium show in a broken glass match, although it hasn't been announced as of yet in Japan. Apparently fans now believe he isn't coming out of retirement and he's popular again for not breaking his word. On the undercard, Toyota got her wish to wrestle her childhood hero, Jaguar Yokota, and they did a 10-minute draw while Koji Nakagawa retained the independent junior title pinning Shoichi Funaki of Battlers. All Japan women started back on the island of Okinawa starting April 19 with a two-night tag team tournament with Minami Toyota and Mariko Yoshida beating Tashio Yamada and Takako Inoue in the finals on April 20 in Itaman. The other major match on the tour was April 21st where Yumiko Hata kept her all-Pacific title beating Reggie Bennett with a cross-armbreaker submission. JWP ran Karakuen Hall on April 21st drawing about 1,500 with a one-night younger girls tournament to create the first Karakuen Hall tag team champions as Tomoko Kuzumi and Yuki Miyazaki beat Rieko Amano and Tomoko Miyaguchi in the finals. The belts will be defended on every JWP show at Karakuen. In the main event, a two-on-three match, there was an upset as the three, Hikari Fukuoka and Kandi Akutsu and Hiromi Yagi, beat the two, Dynamite Kansai and Cutie Suzuki, when Fukuoka pinned Kansai for the first time. LLPW announced creating of its own trio's title belts and a tournament will take place from May 10th to May 20th. USWA All there has been a lot of talk about it over the past week, it doesn't appear a decision has been made regarding this group moving its regular Monday night shows in Memphis from the Mid-South Coliseum to the Big Flea Market, with a 2,400-seat capacity. The flea market contacted Jerry Lawler and offered him a much more favorable rent deal than the Coliseum. USWA has had problems on and off with the Coliseum, and in particular manager Beth Wade going back several years as USWA believes Wade doesn't really care whether or not the local wrestling promotion books the arena for something like 50 dates per year. Problems surfaced again recently when Wade fined USWA general manager slash booker Randy Hales $500 after wrestlers broke stuff backstage. The arguments in favor of moving are that the rent will be cheaper, relations with management will be better, and it's been a long time since the group has drawn 2,400 to a show so the capacity is more than enough. The belief is that as long as there is raw and nitro on Mondays, that the crowds in Memphis are limited and nowadays it's Nashville and Louisville that carry the circuit as opposed to Memphis carrying the entire territory as had been the case since there was a territory. However, Memphis wrestling and Monday nights go hand in hand, as the recent attempt to bolster attendance by moving to Wednesday didn't work out either. The downside is that wrestling has been a tradition in the Coliseum, that a previous move from the building to the fairgrounds years ago for a few months was considered unsuccessful and they were back in the Coliseum, that the company will look more minor league and thus crowds would drop even more which may make up for the decrease in rent. The way it was explained to me, the company doesn't want to make the move but they are looking at possibly making the move but no decision has been made. Another story floating around is that Jeff Jarrett will work out the remainder of his WWF contract, which is believed to expire around November, by working for this group and would then jump to WCW. As best we can tell, the WWF is still expecting Jarrett to return over the next month or two, but there is at least smoke to the fire in regard to eventually going to WCW. As far as stories regarding Brian Christopher and WWF, Christopher is under contract to WWF and has been since at last late 1994. However, WWF has no imminent plans of bringing him in although it is expected that at some point he'll be in. The April 15th show in Memphis, which was billed as Channel 5 night with all seats $5, saw the crowd boosted to nearly 1200 in the house at about $5,800 with Jerry Lawler and Jeff Jarrett doing a 60-minute draw for the unified title in Jarrett's first match back since being out a few months after a serious back injury. The match was slow-paced but the crowd was into it and it had great heat for the final 12 minutes. Lawler and Jarrett did at least two other 60-minute draws in title matches, one of which was April 20th in Nashville, by which time Jarrett had won the title and begun a heel turn for the first in his home territory. Also on the April 15th show, Samantha won the USWA ladies title from Miss Texas, Cyberpunk Ice kept his mask beating Tommy Rich and Bill Dundee regained his van in a match where he vowed to retire if he lost to Cyberpunk Fire. That finish saw Samantha throw Dundee a chain after a ref bump. Jarrett won the unified title on April 20th on live Memphis television. During the match, both did some hill tactics but worked as faces. The crowd was about 50 to 50 and it was a pretty good match and lasted more than 18 minutes. The first false finish saw ref Frank Morell get bumped, and Lawler used his fist drop and covered Jarrett but no ref. As Lawler was helping Morell up, a much heavier than the last time we saw him, Tony Falk showed up, 
and hit Lawler with a chain. They teased a countout finish but Lawler got back in time. After several more near falls, Lawler again used a fist drop and this time Morel keeled over as if he were having a heart attack. Lawler then attended to Morel, at which point Jarrett came from behind him with a schoolboy and Morel quickly got up and counted the fall. After the match Jarrett did a heelish interview when Lawler came out, saying he expected things like what happened with Falk, but didn't expect what happened with Frank Morel doing a Fred Sanford fake heart attack. Lawler then asked for a title rematch with the time remaining on the show claiming that when Jarrett was able to return from his back injury, Lawler gave him an immediate title shot. Jarrett talked about giving Lawler a shot and maybe not even having him wait 30 days for it but said he had to defend the title on April 22nd against Christopher. Lawler said that Christopher would gladly step aside, which brought out Christopher who said that Lawler was sadly mistaken. Falk then came out and claimed the reason he did what he did was because Lawler had gotten him fired the last time he was in USWA. Jarrett claimed to have no knowledge of what Falk or Morel had done, but when Lawler threw Falk into the ring and started beating on him, Jarrett attempted to save Falk but was cut off by Christopher. It appears Morel is going to wind up managing Jarrett. Vader, who didn't appear on television this weekend, is billed for a spot show on April 26th. King Mabel and Brickhouse Brown did an interview where they announced Reggie B. Fine as the newest member of Men on a Mission and Mabel gave him a crown and a robe. April 22nd Memphis show has Sean Williams and Jesse James Armstrong vs. Headbangers, Samantha defending the women's title against Texas, Cyberpunks defending the tag titles against Tommy Rich and Doug Gilbert, Moondogs vs. Men on a Mission with Moondog Rules, Dundee vs. Fire in a first blood match, Lawler vs. Falk and Jarrett defending against Christopher. The newest moon dog, called Rover, who is teaming with Spot, Larry Booger, is an indie wrestler from West Tennessee. ECW Blood is back, well, short of. On the April 16th television show they aired an interview with Tommy Dreamer, where he was bleeding during the promo. They also had blood on both weekend house shows, April 19th in Plymouth Meeting, Pennsylvania, and April 20th, at the ECW Arena. The Plymouth Meeting show saw one of the Bruce brothers bleed from the back of the head, so it was clearly unintentional. At the ECW Arena show, Raven bled in his title defense against Shane Douglas which was also said to be unintentional. According to Paul Heyman, because of insurance reasons, he said he's not even considering bringing back the blade and that under normal circumstances he'd have stopped the Raven-Douglas match because of the blood but since it was the main event, felt they needed to have the pin finish. He said Dreamer bleeding was planned but it was an interview, and not during a show so there is no insurance problem. He said that he overestimated the effect of the Tommy Morrison HIV story and that at some point in time the probability is bleeding might return, but it isn't going to be soon. The lack of blood had turned into an issue because the promotion was built on many things, blood being one of them, and at every show you can sense fans wanting blood. The April 20th show drew a full house estimated at about 1,075 for a good show with a hot crowd with a highlight being the Beulah Angle and a Sabu vs. Rob Van Dam singles match. Show opened with the gangsters doing a promo and the Eliminators came out and they brawled all over the place. Supernova faced El Puerto Ricano in an opener which went 3-0-4 before the Eliminators beat up both guys and gangsters ran in making the save. Mikey Whipwreck pinned Billy Black in 7-0-9. Bubba Ray Dudley and Devon Dudley went to a no contest with the Pit Bulls in 10-37. Taz beat the debuting Devin Storm, so I'd assume that means he's done with WCW, in 4.55 via countout after suplexing him over the top rope to the floor and choking him out on the floor. After the match, Storm did a stretcher job and Taz talked about him on the mic as being just another Sabu wannabe. Storm had just had his knee scoped and was told by his doctor not to get back in the ring until after the first week of May. Storm, who is currently attending medical school, said he wasn't getting booked enough with WCW since he was on a nightly deal to pay his bills. Axel Rotten pinned Little Guido, formerly Damian Stone, in 6.51. Sandman and Two Cold Scorpio beat Bruce Brothers in 8.12. The most memorable part of the match was, after fans were chanting smoking guns at the Bruce Brothers, one of the twins threw a chair into the crowd and it hit a fan. Hyman was really upset backstage by that. Brian Lee pinned Dreamer when the Bruce Brothers did a run-in with a cinder block, which they put on his groin and hit the block with a chair. Sabu pinned Van Dam in the best match of the show with the typical crazy spots. Sabu re-injured his tailbone during the match. After the match, Sabu tried to shake Van Dam's hand but Van Dam refused. Raven kept the title pinning Shane Douglas in the main event when Stevie Richards interfered superkicking Douglas. 
Speaking of Richards, although we had expected him to be out of action for some time after the broken orbital bone in his face, he was actually back in the ring on an indie show in the Pittsburgh area on April 21st. After the match Douglas said that the ECW title was the only title in wrestling that means anything and he wouldn't wipe his ass with any other belt. This brought out Scorpio who said that people like he, Dean Malenko, Eddie Guerrero and Terry Funk worked very hard to make the ECW TV title mean something, and asked who does Douglas think he is to degrade it. Douglas again said he wouldn't wipe his ass with the belt and wound up laying out both Scorpio and Sandman with the title belt after the match. Only matches announced for May 11th at the ECW Arena are Sabu vs. Van Dam in a respect match, basically the I quit match rules, and Scorpio vs. Douglas for the TV title. Beef Wellington Shane Bauer from Calgary is headed in April 27th in Wilmington, Delaware at the Big Kahuna nightclub as Scorpio vs. Sabu for the TV title, Raven vs. Douglas for the ECW title, Illuminators and Richards vs. Pitbulls and Francine, Sandman vs. Rotten, Taz vs. Whipwreck, Dreamer vs. J.T. Smith and Fred the Elephant Boy from the Howard Stern Show tries to get a date with Missy Hyatt. Smith was injured and couldn't wrestle over the weekend because Devon Dudley didn't know how to throw a chair shot without killing anyone in New York and a week later, his ears were still ringing. They were supposed to debut he and Little Guido as an Italian tag team. On April 19th in Plymouth meeting Pennsylvania Dudley aware of what he did, toned down the chair shots he was supposed to do to the point they looked terrible. April 19th show drew 350 with highlights being another 20-minute draw for the TV title with Scorpio and Sabu in a match with a lot of great spots. Douglas and Sandman beat Van Dam and Black in a bad match which ended up with Sandman caning Douglas, and Raven kept the title beating Dreamer when Lee interfered and after the match, the Pitbull superbombed Dreamer onto Blue Meanie through a table. Headhunters were advertised for the weekend shows but didn't appear because they were booked in FMW and won't be back until July. Here and there. Tickets for the World Wrestling Peace Festival were supposed to have gone on sale this past week with seats priced at $65, $28 and $14. No update on the show. Gong Magazine in Japan listed a lineup for the first time in this week's issue which were all matches previously listed here along with Jushin Liger vs Chris Benoit. At press time that match is not on the books because WCW hasn't okayed the match although New Japan has suggested it. Sabu may not be able to work the triangular match because of a Japanese booking. The Sheik, as in Ed Farhat, had another hip operation on April 17. Sheik, now 70, is expected to manage Sabu on an upcoming Japanese tour. Jimmy Snuka and King Kong Bundy will headline an AWF show in Waltham, Massachusetts on May 16. A correction from last week's issue regarding the NWC show on May 17 in Las Vegas. Superstar Billy Graham won't be making an appearance on the show. Graham blamed himself somewhat for the mix-up saying that promoter T.C. Martin called him and was very nice about asking him to appear, and he said he'd consider it as a way to be nice, but has since said that he felt he couldn't do it. Graham believes appearing as a guest on a pro wrestling show isn't conducive to his current religious work. Blast from the past department, Iron Sheet, now 56, appeared on a pair of weekend shows for Steel City Wrestling. Cleveland All Pro Wrestling is running a TV taping on May 11th and for those interested in attending or working the show, you can call 216-476-1357. UFC There actually was a positive newspaper column on UFC, ironically written by Observer Reader and pro wrestling promoter Gary Woronchik, who is the managing editor of the Dearborn Press and Guide in a Detroit suburb. Woronchik wrote in response to the Detroit News story a few weeks back entitled The Ultimate Blood Sport, was that something sounding that barbaric is an easy target for critics who would just scratch the surface with sound bites, generalizations and outright inaccuracies without fully examining the sport. Woronchuk criticized the Detroit story's premise that UFC will take place primarily because there are no laws to stop it. Woronchuk wrote that more effective than laws would be a lack of spectators, but there is no scarcity in that area. He also wrote that you can't have a society condone boxing and deny UFC-style events and that UFC isn't a human cockfight, nor a tough man contest. WCW. It appears Hulk Hogan won't be around until August as he's taking time off to do a movie. There's a lot of sentiment that Hogan brought the company to a new level that they couldn't have reached without him, but that it's better for all concerned if Hogan only appeared on a few guest shots a year rather than dominated every Nitro and pay-per-view show. Tentative plan is for Hogan to return on the August pay-per-view against either Scott Hall or Kevin Nash in their new role, although that will change 50 times between now and then. In fact, if Monday ratings drop, and they probably will even though there is no head-to-head -head due to the earlier time combined with it being light outside at 7pm, it could cause a panic and from that standpoint, 
Hogan's timing of leaving couldn't have been better. The weekend television ratings started their seasonal decline this week because the weather started improving so when that takes place it should be nothing for anyone to panic over but again, the timing will look great in hindsight for Hogan. Supposedly Hogan's contract with WCW expires after the pay-per-view match with Savage which now will also be a monster trucks match as well. The logic of Hogan destroying everyone in sight and in particular, popping up from the Giants finisher, when Giant laid out Sting and Luger with it when Giant and Sting are the ones the company is going to be built around all summer when he wasn't even going to be back for months shows just how much power he truly has and just how much he cares about doing the right thing for the company. Nitro on April 22nd in Albany, Georgia before 6,500 fans, 3,800 paying $31,335, saw American males over public enemy via DQ in 723 when they threw Scotty Riggs over the top rope. After the match, enemy did the P.E. sandwich, both crashing onto Riggs, who was on a table on the floor, going through the table. Bagwell is the only one of the four whose offense looked even passable. One and three quarter stars. Chris Benoit pinned Eddie Guerrero holding the ropes in 742. The announcers buried this match, talking over even the near falls and big moves and instead talked about the Savage Flair pairing at Battle Bowl. It was actually almost like watching three people doing a parody of being bad announcers. Geez, they had Duggan versus Meng which they could have ignored instead of these guys. It would have been a good match for anyone else, but considering who was involved it wasn't much. Three stars, Rob Garner, looking totally out of place, threatened Randy Savage with a suspension and Savage threatened to do the David Schultz to Garner. Jim Duggan pinned Meng in 553 after knocking him out with a taped fist. One quarter of one star. Sting and Luger went to a no decision with Flair and Giant in 725. From a logic standpoint, the rules made less than no sense. It was explained that the tag titles were at stake, plus the TV title and the world title, that that Sting could also pin Luger or Giant could pin Flair and win their titles. Since it was a tag match, that made no sense and it should have been a four corners match with those rules, or they should have never said Giant could pin Flair and win the world title since it wasn't going to happen anyway and it made it sound like whomever came up with the idea and those who approved the idea were so loaded on drugs as to not have any clue. The match had super heat with Flair in most of the way doing all his typical stuff. Finish saw woman give Flair the coffee, which she had been holding seemingly forever, and he tried to throw it at Sting or Luger, but it went in Giant's eyes instead. And then, for more logic, with Giant out of commission, either Sting or Luger should have had easy pickings beating Flair for the world title. So instead, they simply left the ring because they were scared of the blind Giant. Flair tried to placate the Giant, who wouldn't listen and they ended up issuing the challenges for the world title match. All I've heard about the April 29th show is, besides the title change, Sting and Luger beat Harlem Heat to keep the tag titles, Steiners beat Scott Norton and Ice Train when Rick pinned Train, and Steve Regal pinned Belfast Bruiser. I heard the latter match was the best of the four with both guys bleeding hard way, brawling outside the ring into the parking lot where Regal pile drove Finley through a car windshield. WWF Raw scored a big win in the ratings on April 22nd, with a 3.3 rating and 5.0 share its best figure head-to-head -to, -head to date, while Nitro did a 2.7 and 4.1 share. The Nitro replay did an 0.9 rating and 2.8 share. Breaking it down into quarter hours tells an even more interesting story. WWF actually destroyed WCW for the first 45 minutes, by a 3.5 to 2.4 margin which if it had held up, would have been the largest margin for a WWF win to date. However, it reversed in the last 15 minutes as WCW shot up from a 2.4 to a 3.2 for the tag team match while WWF fell off by a 3.5 to 2.9 which closed the final rating. Murder She Wrote, which precedes Raw, is now beating Thunder in Paradise by a 3.0 to 1.1. WCW's other weekend numbers saw Saturday Night do a 2.4, main event a 2.2 and Pro a 1.3. The tentative lineups for June 28th in Hartford, June 29th in Philadelphia and June 30th at the Paramount in Madison Square Garden are Giant vs. Sting for the WCW title, Ric Flair vs. Randy Savage, a triangular match with Road Warriors, Nasty Boys, and Public Enemy, Lex Luger vs. Arnold Anderson for TV title, Steiners vs. Harlem Heat, Conan vs. Kevin Sullivan for US title, Eddie Guerrero vs. Chris Benoit and Diamond Dallas Page vs. Booty Man. Tentative Nitro dates for June are June 3rd in Asheville, North Carolina, June 10th in Wheeling, West Virginia, June 17th in Richmond, Virginia, and June 24th in Charlotte. For July, the tentative plan is to do Nitro on July 1st at the U.S. Air Arena in Landover, Maryland, 
July 8th in Lakeland, Florida and from that point all tapings for both Nitro and WCW Saturday Night will be done at Disney with the Nitro being live and the Saturday Night Show being taped on Tuesdays and they'll run Thursday to Friday Saturday House Show swings most weekends. We don't have details on the shows, but the weekend house shows were very successful. April 20th in Little Rock, Arkansas drew 6,000 fans and $65,000. The main event was Flair Savage, however Flair missed his flight as his son Reed kept winning in a national amateur wrestling meet, he ended up placing third in his age group, 83 pounds so Savage beat Chris Benoit in the main event. Flair Savage headlined April 21st in Jackson, Tennessee which drew 4,718 fans, about 100 shy of capacity, and $53,000. A phenomenal figure since it's the largest wrestling crowd in that city in 12 years and WCW has no local television in the market. Road Warriors vs. Steiners was scheduled as the semi in both cities, which is a hot drawing match, but didn't take place since Warriors cancelled a few weeks back and Steiners wrestled Harlem Heat and Public Enemy instead. The other show of the week was a WCW Saturday night taping on April 17th in Anderson, South Carolina which drew a sellout 4,000 turning more than 1,000 away, 2,700 paying $15,000 as tickets were really cheap, which airs this coming Saturday. Public Enemy and Nasty Boys had another brawl and Sting and Luger vs. Harlem Heat did some kind of a finish involving Jimmy Hart that I didn't get details of but ends up building to a rematch on Nitro. Shark, who was earning $250,000 per year, was cut to make room for the impending salaries of Hall and Nash. Jushin Liger appears on the May 6 Nitro against Dean Malenko. Bischoff snidely ran down Raw, giving away the results twice during the show. He also sent a get well to Brian Pillman and mentioned his auto accident. This week's Worldwide Gap was airing a match with Luger vs. Kurosawa. In this match, Luger had Jimmy Hart in his corner, despite it being on the March 24th pay-per-view show when Luger said that Hart would no longer be in his corner, and Luger used the megaphone for the finish and worked as the heel in the match. The announcers and voiceovers didn't even make an attempt to explain what was going on in the framework of changing storylines, for the week ending April 7th, WCW's television shows were viewed in 5.54 million homes on 179 stations to WWF's 4.30 million homes on 161 stations. Eric Bischoff, in an interview with Mike Mooneyham on the Wrestling Observer Hotline talked about his side of the Mark Merrill leaving. People want to jump all over this thing and paint Eric Bischoff as Satan because that's kind of in vogue right now. But Johnny came to me and expressed his concern. And what did we do? We changed it. If you look at the television, it's quite obvious. We didn't have a problem with it. I was concerned he was taking his professional on-camera life way too seriously. He had a problem with Kimberly as his valet because he doesn't know how to answer his daughter. I understand that. We made the change. But what happens if we need him to take on a different character? Where's the line? How do we know what we can do with a talent when we don't know how the talent's personal life is going to be affected by it? That's the issue that I brought up and we resolved the issue. That was not an issue between Johnny and I. He's bringing it up because he wants to make it appear he was justified in making the decision he made. But the reality is that we overcame that problem and we had moved on in an entirely different direction. Actually, I believe both Marrow and Bischoff would both agree that the aspect regarding him asking for Kimberly to be taken away from him was totally overplayed by a lot of people in regard to it being a significant reason Marrow left the promotion, and other aspects such as Titan's ability to make new stars. Getting a job for his wife and minor heat over other things with WCW being more important. WWF The Germany tour ended on April 22nd with a show in Munich and the first match back in the US is the pay-per-view. The matches in Germany remained basically the same as last week with Shawn Michaels, Undertaker and Bret Hart alternating beating heels Hunter Hearst Helmsley, Diesel, Owen Hart, and Steve Austin. With Goldust gone, Razor Ramon was given wins over 1-2-3 Kid and Justin Bradshaw. Gates were April 15th and Oldenburg did $203,611, selling out a 5,700-seat arena, April 16th in Hamburg did $189,883, about 5,300. April 17th in Berlin did $304,894. Selling out an 8,500-seater. April 18th in Rostock did $106,281. 3,000. April 19th in Halle did $167,367. Selling out 4,751 seats. April 20th in Bayreuth drew $135,680. 3,637. 
and April 21st in Stuttgart drew $174,972, $4,900. With four weeks out before the show, the Madison Square Garden advance for May 19th was closing in on $200,000 so the show should easily sell out which would be the first back-to-back -back MSG sellouts probably going back to around 1985. April 20th weekend rating saw Action Zone do a 1.6 and Mania and 0.9, as the better weather starts to erode on the numbers. Bret Hart is getting far too much play on television for someone who supposedly hasn't decided for sure if he's coming back. In addition, WWF has ordered toy makers to create new dolls and they are creating a new Bret Hart doll and these won't be out for a long time. It was funny during one of Hart's interviews where he said that if Michaels wrestles, at his best that Diesel won't even come close to beating him which is exactly the opposite of what you would want fans thinking going into a title match on pay-per-view, but they aired it anyway since overall it was a great interview. Without saying so directly, they are trying to do a tease to fans who do know that Diesel is leaving by teasing that he might leave and take the WWF title belt with him to WCW without actually saying any of that. On the April 22nd Raw show, they aired an angle taped April 20th in Bayreuth involving Davy Boy Smith and Jake Roberts. The angle was pretty bad since it was hard for Smith to look vicious with his knee so tender and the bad knee was obvious since all he did was stomp, which is where knee injuries become the most obvious. Roberts wound up making his own comeback and laid Smith out and put the snake on him, which is kind of a weird thing for a face to get all his revenge before the first match takes place. It's also surprising to see them put Smith in this position against a lower level babyface when the idea was to start rebuilding him. Speaking of Smith, one of the sleaziest things WWF has done in a while was on the April 15th Raw when they did a 900-line tease saying to call to find out what Davy Boy Smith and Magic Johnson have in common besides both being professional athletes. Naturally this started the rumor mill going that Smith was HIV positive, which of course isn't the case. Don't know what the payoff to the tease was but for a company which just a few weeks ago was going on and on about scheme gene, this tease was worse than 85% of Gene's sleaziest. Bam Bam Bigelow is upset with WWF claiming he was promised an unconditional release provided he put Goldust over on pay-per-view but then he got a release that was conditional on him not working for WCW, which is where he was hoping to work. He's contractually free to go to WCW in October. The Reader's Pages Pancrase Here are a few things about Pancrase to think about. 1. Why are the fighters allowed to kick each other with shoes? You can't do that in the UFC. The shin pads didn't cover the hardest part of the shoe, the bottom. Front and side kicks, which use the bottom of the shoe were thrown. 2. Why are punches not allowed and brutal leg kicks rarely used? Could it be because punches are impossible to fake convincingly and leg kicks, while not as difficult to fake as punches, are hard to make look full power and the fighters tend to overreact when hit by them, like in UWFI? I don't think you'll see too many people outside of shoot fighting get knocked out cold by a palm hill slap. Three. Why do none of the fighters seem terribly worried when they are obviously in a position to be choked out and a fighter in the position to do the choking rarely tries very hard to do so? You rarely see anybody who knows chokes in the UFC not take advantage of the opportunity. 4. With points scored so infrequently, doesn't it seem silly that Ken Shamrock would have said that one fighter, in a dominant position, would just let his opponent up when the opponent would lose a point if he locked on a submission hold because of a rope break? would decide against working for the submission because he didn't want to give away any of his submissions. Doesn't he know at least a few? 5. I've never heard of a boxing, kickboxing or judo organization that only consists of about 20 fighters, most of whom are trained by the same people, who just rotate fighting one another. The UFC is actually fairly easy to get into and anyone can compete. From what I understand, Pancrase is a very exclusive organization and difficult to get into. I wonder why? Also, why are the fighters paid salary like pro wrestlers instead of given purses for each match based on the result? 6. Finally, doesn't it seem strange that even Semaphore Entertainment Group won't come out and state officially that Pancrase is 100% real? Pro wrestling is great, but in no way should it be confused with something real like UFC. I love the Rocky movies, but Sylvester Stallone was never the legitimate heavyweight boxing championship of the world. Let's not blur fantasy and reality. Pancrase may occasionally have some legitimate shoots but so do the UWFI. It is not terribly hard to tell the difference between real matches and not so real matches. Pancrase is simply a better worked, the less entertaining, version of UWFI. As much as I like and respect Ken Shamrock, I have to say that if he wants to claim any glory from his victories in Pancrase, he is also going to have to acknowledge his losses in pro wrestling matches, such as his loss to Bart Valley, which was an obvious work. You can't have it both ways. Joe Silva Richmond, Virginia. 
ECW while I suppose everyone is entitled to his or her own opinion, I can't help but laugh when I read letters like the one from Kurt Pileski in the April 8th issue that sing the praises of the WWF, an organization that single-handedly destroyed pro wrestling in the 80s by pushing physical freaks as its top performers, and WCW a promotion so lacking in originality and creativity that their booking can only be described as directly imitating the worst of the 80s WWF. The letter makes the implication that ECW has no bragging rights over WCW and WWF because they only draw 1,000 people per show. Both WWF and WCW are multi-million dollar corporations with television shows on major national cable outlets. With all that going for them, they have no excuse to not draw 10,000 people to each and every show they promote. Yet they only outdraw ECW, a promotion with limited television distribution and a shoestring budget, by a few thousand people per show. I find it interesting that the writer thinks it's a knock on ECW that they produce only one hour of television per week. Personally I respect a promotion that puts on only one hot hour per week that leaves fans wanting more as compared with WWF and WCW, who oversaturate the market with endless hours of non-entertaining television that leaves their audience looking to get a new hobby. As for the statement that WWF and WCW have better wrestlers than ECW well, that's probably accurate. But the problem is that the majority of the time, particularly in WCW, the great wrestlers are at the bottom of the card and we fans get three stars main events like the Doomsday Cage match. In regard to the statement that Paul Heyman gets too much credit for his booking, that's way off the mark. Yes, Bubba Ray Dudley is a silly gimmick, but it's a low-card comedy gimmick as it should be. If Bubba was in WCW, he'd be pushed to the top as a monster heel and be put in a program with Hulk Hogan. Paul Heyman creations like Sandman, Raven, Public Enemy and 911 are classic examples of how a great gimmick can make a wrestler more marketable. It's the opposite in WWF and WCW where the majority of gimmicks, like Goldust and Booty Man, make wrestling look silly and embarrass me as a fan. Of course ECW's ultraviolet style isn't suited for everyone's tastes. Likewise, I can certainly understand why an ECW performer would prefer to be a small fish in a big pond with WWF and WCW when it means making more money but when I was in college and lacked the time and resources to do any type of heavy tape trading, the only wrestling I had available to me was WWF and WCW. My interest in wrestling dwindled so dramatically I pretty much stopped subscribing to The Observer and ultimately stopped watching all wrestling. It wasn't until I graduated last May and was able to start tape trading again that my interest in wrestling was renewed. I'm proud to say ECW is a large part of what brought me back to wrestling after being turned off by WWF and WCW. Sam Knorr Walnut Creek, California. Regarding Jeff Amber's characterization of Shane Douglas as a total package, I must ask when will people wake up and realize that Douglas is overrated? Douglas was not a product of clueless WWF booking. Douglas came into the WWF, high off the ink fumes from reading his own press clippings, expecting the world to be handed to him. When it wasn't, he responded by developing a personal vendetta against Razor Ramon and Shawn Michaels. The crowning jewel of his abysmal tenure in the WWF was his reign as IC champion, as it clearly illustrated Douglas as the overhyped wrestler he really is. His pathetic showing and his subsequent premature departure portrayed him as a self-absorbed, conceited windbag and finally proved that he will never be able to rise above mid-card status in a major promotion. My advice to ECW hardcores and Observer readers is to reinvest your admiration of Douglas to someone who is more deserving. My advice to Douglas is to be happy being a big fish in a small pond. John Molinaro, North York, Ontario. Read your assessment of ECW and found it to be extremely on the mark. I've attended all three Queen shows and I always buy ringside so I know that even at 6-2, I'll be able to see. Last time I got lucky and got front row. For all my luck, MWZ friend got hit in the head flush with a chair as people were throwing chairs all over the place during the Gangsters vs. Headhunters brawl. I'm not complaining. We go there with the knowledge of the potential consequences. I was in Philadelphia last October during the fire and I ate a little fire extinguisher mist, saw people freak out, saw a guy get his nose broken, so I have a pretty good perspective concerning possible mortality while attending an ECW event. But I love it for the nature that these guys run amazing angles and surprises. I love Sandman for the punishment he takes, and not for what he dishes out. Anyone can deliver a hard chair shot. It's another thing to take one and finish the match drinking your own blood. The most important thing the ECW fans have to realize is that the wrestlers are the show and not us. I understand that they take our weapons, but I don't think they are looking for a chair thrown over the barricade from a guy in the 10th row. 
Paul Heyman is to be admired. He's a mad scientist. If his subjects want to shoot a bullet in their heads to get over, that's their business. I just don't think that means the fans in Queens should bring the gun and start shooting themselves, and I 100% believe if they allowed guns in there it would happen. It's not up to Paul Heyman to calm the fans down. He should know the Queen show didn't suck at all. But they need to eject some people from the fans and then everyone would be better. Mark Hibsher. Brooklyn, New York, April 29, 1996 Observer Newsletter, Brian Pillman Humvee Accident.